Hello, and welcome to SoberCast, where we provide AA speaker meetings and workshops in podcast format. We're an ad-free podcast, and if you enjoy listening, please help us be self-supporting by visiting SoberCast.com, look for the donate link, and drop a dollar or two into our virtual basket. We hope you enjoy the podcast. Have a great day. Good evening. My name is Dave, and I'm an alcoholic. Can you guys hear me in the back? No? All right. Well, then I will project. Before I get started, uh, how many people drove more than two miles to get here? All right. How many people drove on the LIE tonight? All right. How many people are feeling frazzled from their day and need a minute? All right. Why don't we get started, you know, and just kind of get quiet. And part of this uh, experience that I want to share with you is uh, it's all centered around steps 10 and 11. And... Um, one of the things that I've found is that there's a huge misunderstanding in recovery about steps 10 and 11. Um, I've been doing workshops for years and, and speaking for years about the steps, and I've written study guides, and I've done all the stuff that you can do in recovery about the, around this area. And I find that when people come to me with any kind of time under their belt at all, um, and they've got a problem, one of the first things I zero in on is, Where's your, what's your recovery like? And I'll talk to them about it. And um, they'll say, well, you know, my program's okay. I'm doing okay. And I say, well, then what's the problem? Well, they proceed to tell you about the problem. And then I say, okay, let's back up. How did you start your day? Well, there's always a pause. The pause is the problem. So that's why we're here tonight, is to talk about what's supposed to fill in that blank for how did you start your day? And you can start your day at any time of the day. So I started my day at 4-something this morning, so uh, it's been a long day for me, and it's going to go on for a little while longer. So I need to recharge, and the way I do that is I get quiet, and I ask God to come in. So for those of you that may know, this may seem real basic, but one of the things I'd like to do is kind of talk you through at first is, is body positioning for meditation. Um, we'll talk about several different kinds of meditation tonight, uh, but just for good habit purposes, one of the things you want to do is, is sit squarely in your chair. So if it, I want everybody to feel comfortable. So if you're sitting right up next to somebody, see if you can get a, you know, a little bit of room so you're not jammed in tight because you want to feel comfortable. All right? The other thing I want you to do is if your chair has a back on it, I want you to slide your butt to the back of the chair so that you can feel your Feel your butt so you're square, 90 degree angle when you're sitting. Put your feet flat on the floor. All right. The other thing I want you to do is feel comfortable. So whatever feels comfortable as far as your knees. Your knees don't have to be together. They don't have to be apart. Just whatever feels comfortable. A nice even distance depending on on how it feels for your body. Your hands. I want your hands to be in your lap. Uh, I find it easiest if you if I leave my hands palms up. You know what I don't want you to do is cross your fingers, all right? And I'll talk about that more. When you get more advanced, you start doing things, go ahead and cross your fingers, do whatever you want. This is just for the beginners and some real basics. I know there's some people in the room that have never done any kind of meditation at all, and I just want to give you some of the basics. Um, it's better off if you don't cross your fingers. I tend to leave my hands loose with my palms kind of in the open position facing up when, you know, I start my meditation. Now, I want you to envision while you're sitting in this vertical posture that you got a string coming out the top of your head, right? You want to be vertical. You want the spine to be vertical, all right? Or as close to vertical, but don't force it. You know, just get cognizant of it. Imagine somebody pulling on the string, straightening you up, and then just relax, all right? Now, if you're like me and you got a belly, get it up over the top of your belt so you can breathe because where I want you to breathe from is the, what in the martial arts we call the tantien. It's a source of power. It's two inches below the belly button and two inches deep. That's where you're going to breathe to, all right? So you're going to start your breath. Most people go through their nose. Some people have sinus problems and they have to breathe through your mouth. I don't care how the breath gets in there. It's where the breath goes. I want the breath to go to the tantien. So I want you to start at the top of your lungs and fill up your belly. So I know all the women in the room don't like to stick their belly out, but that's how you have to meditate and breathe properly, is you start pushing the air down to the bottom and your lungs will fill up. You'll feel your rib cage start to rise which will actually send your posture. You'll feel the top of your head, that little string. You'll sense the top of your head just move back just the slightest bit as your rib cage lifts up and you fill your, your lungs up. Then you're going to push the air out 
the exact opposite direction. The air is going to go out from the other, other direction. Does that make sense? Is that clear enough? All right. So get in a comfortable position. Put your hands in your laps. Uh, some people like to meditate with their eyes open. I like to close my eyes. So go ahead and close your eyes and just breathe at a natural pace. You should start to feel cognizant. Uh, you'll probably hear your heartbeat, you know, in your ears. Uh, you'll probably hear somebody that's sitting next to you that has a whistle in their nose. Uh, little things around the room, bags shifting or people shifting in their seats. Don't fight it. Just let whatever happens, whatever you hear, just what I want you to focus on is your breathing. I just want you to feel comfortable as you breathe, in and out. Don't force it. Don't try to hold on to it. Don't slow it down and don't count yet. This is basic stuff. Just let it go. Okay, I want each of you to think about the top of your head. Is there any tension in the top of your head? And I want you to work from the top of your head down past your ears and feel the muscles on the back of your neck. If your head is straight up and down, your, the weight of your head should be directly over your spine. So you shouldn't feel any tension in your neck. If you do, I want you to concentrate on those muscles and just tell those muscles to relax. They won't relax. Move your head from side to side once and then put it back into the center position and see if it will relax then. Now go back to thinking about your breathing. Go down your shoulders into your arms. Is there any tension? If there's any tension in your arms, just wiggle the, very lightly, just wiggle the tips of your fingers and then focus on the attention on the, the tight muscles that immediately go back to your breathing. Everybody should be breathing below their belly button. Now go down your back to your butt. Any tension there? Okay, slowly open your eyes. Hopefully the LIE should have left you by now. The guy that cut you off 20 minutes ago should be gone. You should feel at peace and at ease. Is there anybody that doesn't feel at, at more peace and ease now than before they started? Good. Now, how long did that take? Glenn, what does the timer say? How long did that take? Nine minutes. That's nine minutes of meditation. Not hard to do. And we just did it in that little time period. And that took a long time for me to explain that, believe it or not. About 50% of that time I was talking. And so you were thinking. If you've been meditating that entire time, you got about four minutes of, of good meditation in there. If you've been thinking about it, really, you could, have, you could have done that meditation in five minutes or less to get a better feeling. Any time during the day, you just take five. Literally. 
Boom. That's part of what we're here to talk about, is how do we get there? Um, let me give you a little background of how I got here. Um, by, by God's grace, uh, my sobriety date is December 5th, 1981. Uh, I got sober as a teenager. Um, I, I was beaten uh, by this disease and others. You know, I was a garbage head, so I have a background in, in virtually everything you could imagine. Um, but my, my first and foremost love has always been alcohol. And um, coming in as a teenager, uh, there were a lot of the old timers uh, didn't know how to handle me. And, you know, I, I heard a lot very often, um, you know, you're too young to be in here. Um, maybe you should go out and try it some more. And uh, this one old character in, in Dover, New Jersey, you know, used to always taunt me. And what he really was doing was using my own ego against myself because he'd say, you know, you're just too young to be sober. You're never going to make it. So I'd stay sober for another week just to prove that SOB that I really was going to make it. And uh, before I knew it, I was starting to rack up time. And uh, I got a, I fell into a good sponsor who took me through the book. Um, and in the process of taking me through the book, because uh, he could see that I was I was talking about step work that I – I really didn't understand what I was doing, you know, and, and my older brother had gotten sober a couple months before me, and I was just trying to keep pace with him, so it was really kind of a competition, you know. When I found out that he had actually done a fourth step, I ran out and said, well, who did you do your fourth step with? And went and ran, got the same exact guy and said, hey, I need, to do a, I need to do a fifth step with you, you know, and, you know, I hadn't even written anything, you know. I, I didn't know what I was doing at that point, and so my first sponsor could see that I was off base and was like a ship without a rudder, so he kind of reined me in and said, you know, basically, I was this teenager, and you know, my day consisted of getting up in the morning late, uh, eating breakfast, hanging out with my father, going to an AA meeting, going to a lunchtime meeting, and having lunch uh, at a meeting, then going with my brother to the arcade and playing video games for a couple hours until the next meeting, and then going back to a meeting and drinking lots of Coca-Cola and smoking cigarettes and eating Twix candy bars, and you know, and then I'd go home sometimes to get a meal for mom, you know, grub off the family a little bit, and then I'd go back to another evening meeting. And so one day this guy, Carl, pulls me aside and says, hey, you know, do you have a job? You know, at that time I was unemployable. And I said, well, no. He said, well, you, you have one now. I'll pick you up tomorrow morning at, at, at 6 o'clock in the morning. And so that's how I got started working in recovery. And then when Carl would drop me off at night, he'd say, okay, you got an hour. I'll be back in an hour to pick you up, get showered, get something to eat, you know. And then he'd swing back to my house and he'd pick me up and take me off to a meeting. And slowly but surely through that process, he started to show me the steps out of the big book of Alcoholics Anonymous. And so I learned the steps of the big book with love and compassion with somebody who understood where I was coming from and took the time to show me the steps from a point of view that I could understand because I was this not nosed kid, didn't know anything. And reading a book that was written in 1939, uh, you know, I couldn't relate to a lot of those things uh, that were in here in the writing style. And frankly, I really couldn't read. You know, I'd gotten out of high school and, and I don't know how I got out of high school because, you know, one of the things that scared me to death was to be in an AA meeting and then pass the book around and ask me to read a paragraph because I really couldn't read out loud. I mean, I, I had maybe a second or third grade reading ability when I walked through the doors of Alcoholics Anonymous. Um, so it was it was something that I didn't want to do. And, and Carl took treaded that very softly, and he was very kind about it. And he'd read to me, and then we'd talk about what was in the book. And uh, and over time, and I got the program. And the beauty of it was everybody it was a masonry crew, and everybody that was on the crew was in recovery. So it was like I was in a meeting all day long, you know. So I'd be mixing cement and throwing, you know, 16-inch block, and you know, you you drop one on your toe, and you know, you start swearing, and they'd all go, you know, easy does it, you know, first things first, let's, you know, and you just want to throw them off the scaffold, you know, and then they'd all laugh and and keep coming back, it gets better, you know, and it, it just a constant thing. And after a while, I got to understand the jargon. I got to understand the lingo, and I'd watch these guys do the same thing. If they dropped a 16-inch block on their toe, they'd, they'd go, ow, but they wouldn't react. I mean, I'd throw a tirade. and be throwing shovels, and they weren't like that. And so I got to see from example the program in action. And from, from the time I got up in the morning to the time I went to bed at night, I got to see the program in action. And how I learned about prayer and meditation was in the middle of the winter in New Jersey, driving down the road, and it's one of those mornings where the we're at the crack of dawn, and the sun's coming up, and the mist is hanging up over the river, and Carl cranks the window down. And I look over at him, and I said, Carl, what the hell are you doing? And he's sticking there, and he's got his hand. He's waving out the window. And I said, Carl, what are you doing? He says, I'm waving to God. 
I thought, well, he's nuts, you know, because I did that concept. I didn't have a concept of a God. And but that was a start, you know, and he slowly but surely was introducing me that he had a power greater than himself whom he called God. And it was his concept. And, you know, and then he started pointing things out like, look at that beautiful sunrise. If you were hung over right now, what would you be doing? And I said, I sure wouldn't be seeing the sunrise, you know. The only time I saw a sunrise was if I had got thrown out of an all-night club, you know, and, man, you know, the, the, the light was just too damn bright. It, and that was my version of a sunrise. Seeing the pinks and the, the purples, I, that wasn't part of my life at that point. And so I got to appreciate nature, and I could understand there was a majesty to it and a power that I couldn't explain. So that's how he indoctrinated me, slowly but surely. Um, I've worked the steps out of the big book every way you can work them. Uh, I've worked them what I consider today would be the wrong way, but it was what I needed. My first inventory was not written. I showed up to do an inventory, uh, to do a fifth step. I had not written a single word because I didn't know enough to write a single word. Going to do it because, as I said, my brother had done it before me and I wasn't going to let him beat me at anything. So, in, and the guy that I did it with, it just so happens I had no clue. He, I said, you know, Leo, I need to do a fist step. And he said, okay. And he lived next to a church. And I thought, that's kind of strange. Well, he shows up and I knock on the door and he's got a collar on and I just about died on the spot. You know, that shows you how quick I am. And, you know, my second inventory was written on the back of an envelope in that parking lot before my second meeting with Leo. You know, to, I, I wrote some stuff, stuff down. So I didn't do the four column inventory as it is in the book until my third formal in, inventory process of my, what I consider my third time through after somebody had shown me the instructions. So I don't know what your basis is for where you are here. And frankly, that's not what this night is about. Your sponsor can show you. There's plenty of tapes. I've done dozens and dozens of retreats and workshops on the nuts and bolts of how to work the steps. What I'm here to talk about is what I see as an a absolute plague with an Alcoholics Anonymous. People are walking around dumping in AA meetings, and they're getting a spiritual high off the group spirituality. They're bringing a problem there because they're not working any recovery, and AA has become a spiritual filling station for them. And they walk in, they dump their problem, and they feel better when they leave, but there's no recovery. And they last only as long as they can until their next meeting when they walk in and usually dump the exact same problem, just on a, a different group of people, week after week after week. And if they bother to stop and talk to a sponsor or a spiritual advisor they get the poor me's, you know, oh, this is going on in my life, and they're looking for sympathy. They're really not looking for recovery. And the problem lies as everything other problem that I've ever found in Alcoholics Anonymous. When I have a problem, the problem lies within me. It's inside of me. It's, a, it's something that I need to start the work out of. And so when I have somebody that comes to me with one of those problems, and they say, Dave, can I talk? Sure, I can always be willing to talk. What do you got? And they start into telling me some problem about work. I always immediately take them back and say, well, tell me about your start of your day. And as I already discussed, you know, that's, I, let's go back to the beginning. Where did your day start? What did you do this morning? Well, I said my prayer and meditation. Oh, you did? Where did you do that? Uh, well, I just got out of the shower. was on my way to work. I said, uh, that's not what I asked. Where did you say your prayer and meditation? Well, I was in the car, uh, you know, on the way to the train station. And I said, oh, so you're meditating while you're driving. That's real healthy, you know. <laughs> For all the other drivers in the world, I suggest you don't do that behavior anymore. Um, and that explains to me why you're having a problem, because you've got no connection. You've got no power. So the way I live my life is I get up every morning and I plug into the power. If I don't, at 24 plus years sober, my life falls apart. So I've learned from the experience, because I've done it the wrong way, of trying to self well run riot. See, the key is, I would bet 99% of the people in this room walked into AA because they'd had the absolute snot knocked out of them by ethanol. And they said, help me. I want help. But really all they were saying was, help me with this problem, the alcohol problem. Leave my wife and my girlfriend or my boyfriend, whatever the case is. Leave my significant other alone. Leave my job alone. I'll take care of the finances. I'll take care of the kids. I'll take care of everything else. You just got to help me with this problem because that's where I really have the problem with. That's not how this deal works. You know, the second step is very clear on that subject. It said, you know, either God is everything or God is nothing. God either is or he isn't. What is your choice to be? If God is everything, I have to give God everything. That's the deal. When I give it to him, he gives it right back. The difference is I'm no longer the owner of that 
I am now the servant. I'm working for him. And he only gives back what I can handle for that day. So I get up every morning and I plug into the power source and say, God, what do you have for me? And he gives me the outline. All right? And that's really what we're here to talk about, is how do you start your day? It seems kind of weird. It's a, it, we're talking about steps 10 and 11. All right? First of all, where does that cover it in the big book? It, it starts really on page 84, is step 10, but it leads us back to page 83 if we're going to do it right. And really, let me make a, a kind of a, a bold statement. In theory, if we're working the basic program of Alcoholics Anonymous, there's a minimum of 12 prayers and 12 meditations you're supposed to be doing every single day. And if you're sitting in this room and you haven't done 12 prayers and 12 meditations today, then you missed some part of this program. And that's what we're going to cover tonight. So one of the things that I hope is, does everybody have a big book? Yes? All right. Does everybody have something to write with? Because one of the things that I'm going to have you do, if you're willing and you're up for this stuff, is we're going to go through, and I'm going to go, you're going to put a P1 and a P2 and a P3 for all the different prayers, and you're going to put an M1 and an M2 and an M3 for all the meditations. So, yeah, there's still, there's still some big books back on the table for sale. So if you need one, go back and get one. If you need something to write with, Kelly's got stuff to write with. All right? Let me give you guys a chance to get that together. Take just a second. While we're doing that, is the real coffee made yet? <laughs> Can, yeah, would somebody get me a cup of real coffee? I'm running on empty. My caffeine low level light's on. Just dump hot, real coffee in there. It's all ready to go. Thank you. So why don't we all start out, since I already mentioned the second step proposition, everybody go to page 53 in their big book, and we'll jump right into this. All right. For those of you that have the study edition, I'll use the, the expression colon whatever, which is the paragraph. The, the study editions of the big book are just like, uh, sort of like a Bible. The, if there's part of a paragraph, it's colon zero. The first f full paragraph will be colon one. The second full paragraph will be colon two. So it'll make it easier to find. Where we're going right now is uh, 53 colon two. It's right in the middle of the page. That, all right? And it says, when we became alcoholics, crushed by a self-imposed crisis, we could not postpone or evade. Thank you very much. We had to fearlessly face the proposition that either God is everything or else he is nothing. God either is, either is or he isn't. What is our choice to be? All right? The whole purpose of prayer and meditation is to plug you into a power greater than yourself. So if you don't have the concept that it's possible to have a power greater than yourself, right here we're dead in the water. Does that make sense? You need a power greater than yourself. Now, when I first got sober, I hadn't been raised with any religion or anything. And Carl was very kind. I told you, he started out with, with Mother Nature as g giving me a concept of a power greater than myself. And then it became my home group because there was a whole bunch of people in my home group that were able to stay sober, and I couldn't. So my concept of a power greater than myself has changed year after year, experience after experience. I don't care what your concept of your higher power is, as long as you believe that there's power in it. I've had people tell me that their, their power greater than themselves is a doorknob. Well, came to believe that a, power, that a doorknob can restore you to sanity, that's pretty crazy. You know, it's, it, to me, it should be something that's theoretically tangible for you, whatever that concept has to be. So if you're atheist or agnostic, I usually start out with, does the group have something, have more power than you do? And we'll start with that as the basis. You know, for people that are gun shy from religion, I'll add in nature. People that have some experience with religion, I'll take them to a, some experiences other than the religion they were raised with, because usually that's where, uh, resentment hiding out. You know, especially within, you know, I'm not beating up on the Catholics, but the Catholics tend to be have a real hard time with Catholicism. So I'll take them to some Buddhist principles, just spiritual principles, and say, try this, try that. So. To me, it all leads to the same place, a power greater than myself, and that power is what I need to tap into, all right? You'll notice that it says that God either is everything or he's nothing. There's only two choices, A or B. There is no door number three. You don't get a third choice, right? You either have to have a power or you don't. And if you're going to have this power, he's going to have to be everything, or else he's not going to be anything. Does that make sense? This is a, 
uh, uh, absolutely crucial point is this second step proposition because what have we been trying to do in sobriety? We're back to that game. Take care of the alcohol guy, but let me handle everything else. That's not how this deal works. I need to be willing to give him anything that's on my plate, be that whether it's my physical health, my mental health, my financial health, my relationships, my kids, everything about me is a gift. Because who in here didn't ask God to help you get sober? Is there anybody that got in here that didn't ask God to help you get sober? Is there anybody in here that's been drinking today? No. So every single one of us have had our prayer answered. God help us and we're all sober. So any other problem you've got on your plate today, that's gravy. Does that make sense? You had the problem solved that you were asking for. That's why I'm going to make a very controversial statement right now that Alcoholics Anonymous is not about alcohol. It's about finding a power greater than yourself. It just so happens the byproduct of that is I don't want to drink alcohol anymore. That's the key to this whole deal. I had my focus wrong for years in recovery. I was focusing on alcohol, and then it was focusing on getting the life. Well, I need a job. Well, I've got a job, but I don't want to be digging ditches and throwing concrete the rest of my life. Oh, maybe I'll go to college. So I was digging ditches and going to community college, and then going to another college. And then, geez, how am I, I gotta have, have a significant other, so now I'm chasing girls. You know, and, and then, you know, well, now we're gonna get serious, now I'm gonna get married, and then we're gonna have kids. The, all those are distractions. The sole purpose for me in Alcoholics Anonymous has been fulfilled since the day I walked through the doors. I asked God to get me sober, He got me sober. It's a conditional statement, though. I've got to give him everything as part of that process. All right? So, let's fast forward to page 84 of the big book. Since this is a 10.11 workshop, might as well start where he starts talking about 10.11. 84, uh, colon 2, right in the middle of the page. All right? It says, this thought brings us to step 10. Well, if you read this big book, one of the things that I was taught to do by, not by Carl, but by another sponsor was to play, look for the hidden step. Alright? So, I never pass a sentence without asking myself, is there something about this sentence that I need to take a reference to? And it's, this sentence starts out with this thought. So the obvious question is, what thought? Alright? Well, looking for hands. Who's, who can tell me what the thought is? When we're about ready to start step 10, the whole premise of starting my 10th step is I'm coming off of a certain thought. What's my thought? Promises. Everybody wants to focus in on the ninth step promises, but there's so many more promises. So the moment my eyes open in the morning, I've had to train myself to start focusing on the promise of another day. Because if I get out of bed and go to the bathroom, I, my day can already start off in a bad mood. You know, because if I trip over my suitcase because I got in at 3 o'clock in the morning, now I'm already grumpy, you know. And then I want to get out of the bedroom because I don't want to bring the grumpiness into my wife, so I'll go isolate, you know. And what's the next logical thing? I'll go turn on the computer, sit down at the computer and look at emails. That always really brightens my day. I don't know about you. And then I'm off to the races for having a bad day. So one of the ways to start my day and have a better percentage of an outcome is to try to teach myself the moment my eyes open is to say, thank you, God, it's another day. You gave me another one when I didn't deserve it. Because I've been living on borrowed time since I was a teenager. So that's how I start my day. I'm focusing in on the promise of another day. And it doesn't matter whether I slept well or not, if I'm in a bad mood, good mood. It, it really doesn't matter. If I can start my day by saying, thank you, Lord. And then I get up and I go use the bathroom. I do what I have to do. I'm a, at a much better chance because I've already started the, pro the process of plugging into the power greater than myself. All right? That's how I work it. The next thing, and I'll jump ahead, is the next thing that I usually say is inside the word spiritual is the word ritual. And it, I was years sober before anybody ever pointed that out to me. And so what I'm going to be talking about here is a lot of rituals. I always start with the basics of what is in this big book. And then I build upon that. The longer I'm sober, the more things that I do. And it's different every day. But the same basic foundation is. So when I crack my eyes open, I say, thank you, God. Right? Then I immediately go into, God, please direct my thinking today. Please keep my thought life divorced from self-pity, dishonest, and self-seeking motives and wrong motives, Lord. Right? That's usually 
before I even blow the covers over to climb out of the bed. I gotta start out that way. Because I can get sidetracked in a nanosecond. I'm one of those people that's got one of those very short memories and, and very short attention spans. You know, I think most of us in this room are that way. We're ADHD or whatever they call it these days. Or really, we're, we're anal retentive alcoholics. You know, at least I should speak for myself. I am. And I'm easily distracted. All right? So, it comes from the premise from the very first sentence of step 10 is this thought brings us to step 10. Well, what are the promises? Go back up to the next paragraph. Are these extravagant promises? We think not. They are being fulfilled among us, sometimes quickly, sometimes slowly. Here's a conditional statement. They will always materialize if we work for them. If I get up in the morning and I don't start out with gratitude, thank you God for another day, and asking God to start directing my thinking, right? I'm not necessarily going to get that promise because I'm not working for it. If I can get into the ritual of gratitude and then seeking power, I've already started the work process of action that I need to do that 10 step requires me. Does that make sense? All right. So let's go on, continue on with uh, this thought brings us to step 10, which suggests we continue to take personal inventory and continue to set right any new mistakes as we go along. That's kind of interesting. So playing, find the hidden step in there. What is that telling me? That's telling me that sometime in my day, I should be doing inventory work. There's 12 questions in a page and a half or so that we're going to have to go over. That's a daily inventory. All right? So I'm going to need to be doing some pieces of inventory. There's also inventory that I need to do called spot check inventory. That when I'm feeling agitated, doubtful, or indecisive, I'm going to pause and do some more inventory work. So there's work that I need to be doing throughout my day. If I don't do the work, I don't get the promise. Because the promise is conditional. Remember that. I'll hit that a thousand times. If we work for them. And here's back to my original statement. The people that come to me with a problem, I'm looking to see if they've done any work. And 99% of the time, they want me to do the work for them as their sponsor or as their spiritual advisor. They want me to solve their problem. And let me give you the key to sponsorship. If you've never sponsored anybody or if you've sponsored hundreds of people and you've been successful at it, I guarantee you, you sponsor by question. Because the average alcoholic who gets in these rooms is not a dummy. They're smart people. What we do is we use people as a sounding board if we're doing the work. So I'll come to my sponsor and I'll say, hey, Kirby, by the way, yes, I still have a sponsor. If you don't have a sponsor, get one, all right? So I go to Kirby. I say, hey, Kirby, I got this issue going on. And Kirby will say, well, tell me about it. And as I'm going through, he'll ask me questions. And he was, I don't think he's ever even attempted, since I've been working with the man, to give me a solution to my problem. He'll always say to me something very profound, like, well, what do you think you should do about that? Any good alcoholic worth his salt has got an answer, probably six or seven answers. Well, I know I should be doing this, and I should be doing that, and I should be doing this. Well, do you think maybe you should? Instead of saying, well, why don't you go do that, dummy? He's kind and considerate, and he'll say, do you think maybe you should go attempt to do that? Or he'll ask another really profound statement. Well, have you talked to God about that? You know, there's a Homer Simpson motion for you. Don't! Uh, no, I... I I've been meaning to, you know. You can sponsor yourself if you have a good sponsor, because that's really what a good sponsor does. They're there to help you separate the wheat from the chaff. Because when the hamster gets on the wheel and we start thinking 10 minutes ahead of where we need to be, and it comes back to the, one of the very first things I ever heard when I came into the program of Alcoholics Anonymous. Dave, the key to sobriety is be where your feet are. I did not understand that. Be in the moment. Because here's the deal. Your alcoholism, your disease, your ego tries to get you out of the present moment. Because the only place that you're ever going to come in contact when you're on this physical plane with a power greater than yourself, with, I call him God, the only place I can plug into God is in the present moment. What does my ego try to do? Past, future, past, future. Skipping right over the top of the, of the moment. And it'll do that in the morning like the, uh, this thought will pop into my head. Oh, I have this meeting I have to go to. Oh, man. This guy's going to be at the meeting. I don't want to be there. So now where am I? I'm in the future. Why, you know, if the thought crosses my mind, why don't I want to be in that meeting? Because of the last time I met that idiot. Now I'm in the past. I just, I went from the future right into the past. Yeah, I just know he's going to do that again today. Boom, I'm now back in the future. And the hamster's on the wheel. And where am I not? I'm not where my feet are. 
And if I'm not where my feet are, I cannot have the power that I need. I can't plug into God. Can you all see that? Have you all experienced that for yourself? If you haven't, think about it for a minute. You know, if you watch yourself, you can watch yourself think. You know, when you're in one of those crazy modes, one of the things that we're going to be talking about is when you start that meditation from the top down, you'll be listening for the voice. And you'll hear the voice chattering around in your head. And that's what will start, you'll, you'll start to pick up on it. And then you'll get to know the voice for the first time that voice speaks and you'll be able to go, I know you, there's my disease. And that's hopefully one of the other things that I'm going to teach you here. And it's something that's totally counterproductive from what I currently hear in Alcoholics Anonymous meetings. But what I was taught was, do not be afraid of your disease. Embrace your disease. Anytime your disease is talking to you and you see it, it's a very, very good thing because now you know where it is. If you can't hear it and you can't see it, you don't know where it's going to bushwhack you. Right? Until you're deeply in the throes of, uh, of a problem and, you know, and then what's the first thought that crosses your mind? You know, no, fuck it, let's go get drunk. Right? So the, if you feel the beast, as I call him today, embrace the beast. Say, ah, I see you. I know you. I, I've seen you before. Now he's contained. Now that I've seen him, I can immediately pause and turn to God and say, God, the beast's over here. Help me, Lord. Remove the beast from me. And now I'm protected. Now I can go back to doing his bidding. Does that make sense? All right. Gosh, I got off on a tangent. I don't know how I did that. I must be tired. All right. So, so we're going to continue to sit right. Any new mistakes? When? As we go along. Here's one of the other problems I run into. It'll be 4 o'clock in the afternoon and the phone will ring. And where's Ted? There's Ted. There's one of my guys. <laughs> Coming up on 20 years. Let me tell you. I can tell you stories about this guy that you... It would curl your hair. Ted will call me in the afternoon, and Ted will go, Hey, Dave, it's Ted. I go, Yeah, I know who it is. I saw it on the caller ID. Well, can I talk to you? You got a minute? And I'll say, Yeah, I got a minute. So he'll start down this path, and he's going to tell me to weave this huge yarn, and he's over there, and it's hooking around. And by the time he finally gets back to the, the middle of it, I'll go, Ted, how would your day start out? You know? And then I'll convict him in the middle of it, and I'll say, I'm in Texas, and I know it's an hour difference, but by my watch, it's 4 o'clock Eastern Standard. Why didn't you go to God already? What's going on in your day? We clean this stuff as we go along, you know? Didn't you know you were insane at 10 o'clock in the morning? Well, yeah, but I didn't get to work until 9.50. Oh, okay, so you knew it on the train on the way inbound. Well, yeah, because I had a hard time getting out of the house. Oh, so you knew it at, what, 7.20? Well, yeah, I knew it at 7.20 when I didn't want to get out of bed. Well, did you go to God then? Well, no. So we, one of the things that I've been doing, in the, as you all can tell, I'm in the military, but as an additional duty, I've been a safety officer, investigating crashes and that kind of stuff. And one of the things you do is you, when you investigate a crash is you always back it up, and you can start to see, we call them gates, sort of like it's kind of like a ski, downhill skier where they go between the two poles. An accident doesn't just happen. You cross through these gates, and there's, if, if you break the link in a chain anywhere along the place, the accident wouldn't have happened down here. If, you, if you'd recognize anywhere along that path, and there's all those different checkpoints, and that's what I do with the guys that I sponsor, is I take them back through their day and show them, or at least I try to, you pass a checkpoint there at 7.20 in the morning, and you didn't stop and go to so seek the source of power. And then you had another opportunity at 8.20. Then you had an opportunity when you parked your car at the train station. Then you had an opportunity on the train. Then you had an opportunity when you walked through the door, and your secretary said you got 15 phone calls and 65 emails, and you went, oh, man. You know, then you went in and played solitaire on the computer for an hour and a half instead of getting down and started digging into it. You know, why? Well, because I didn't feel like doing it. Why? Well, because I didn't have any power. Why? Because hours ago, when you started down the path, you didn't get into this. Does that make sense? That's why it's absolutely critical, if you're an alcoholic like me, of the hopeless variety, that you plug in the moment your eyes go, pink. Thank you, God, it's another day. Right? It sounds stupid, at least it did to me when I was new. I was like, yeah, yeah. But now I believe it wholeheartedly because I've got the experience to back it up. All right? And I didn't mean to pick on you that much, but you're a great example. You know? <laughs> What's the difference between Ted, Ted and I? Nothing. I have days where I do the exact same happy horse manure. I went through a period about six months ago where these bills came in, you know, and here's the alcoholic logic. I don't want to deal with those. Right, So they sit on the counter right there. I walk past them 15 times a day if I'm home. There they are. You know, One week goes by. Well, they're not going to be due for another three weeks. They're still good. 
Two weeks go by. Three weeks go by. Well, yeah, I got other things I have to do, you know. Now, it's a full month. They're due within like probably a day or two. And then what's the alcoholic logic say? Well, by the time you write the check and get them in the mail, it's still not going to get there on time. So you're already going to pay the 35 buck late fee. So worry about it. Now you got until next month before you cross that threshold. Does that, does that sound logic to you? You know, at about the three month mark, I finally went down. Now, did I not have the money? Of course, the money was sitting in the account. You know, what was possessing me? I had a fear that I hadn't dealt with. It was attached to a finance, even though I had plenty of money and I had three jobs at the time, the bill sat there. And that's how it can snowball. Now, did I talk to my sponsor anywhere along in that chain? Absolutely. Did I ever mention to Kirby that I got bills sitting there for three months? No. Did my wife ever mention, hey, when are you going to pay your bills? Or in my way, can I want to clean the counter? Yeah, probably 20 times. No, no, I, I don't have time. I'm going to get to those. You know, I got to call up the, uh, the company, see if they'll waive the charges and, you know, all that happy horse manure. Does that sound familiar with anybody that's in this room? That's 24 years stark raving sober. We all get that way. All right? What's the difference between that and where the man is who's sitting in front of you today? This morning, at four something this morning, the first thought that crossed my mind was, I can't believe that alarm is going off, but thank you, God, for another day, for a chance to live in a decent way. God, please direct my thinking, keep my thought life divorced from selfish, dishonest, or seeking motives, especially dishonest motive floor. Off come the covers, out I roll, I start turning off a series of alarms that I set to get me up at that crack of dawn. Does that make sense? It's a ritual. Spiritual, there's got to be a ritual to your spiritual if it's going to be effective. At least that's my experience with it. All right? So, <clears throat> we commence this way of living as we clean up the past. We have entered the world of the Spirit. If I've entered the world of the Spirit, I should have a whole series of additional promises, not just the nine-step promises. I should have patience, peace, tolerance, kindness, charity, hope. There's pr principles throughout the lost chapters. Does everybody know what I'm talking about when I say the lost chapters? The chapters nobody ever reads anymore. Two wives. Family afterwards. Two employers. A vision for you. If you guys want an extra credit homework assignment, I'll give it to you right now. A vision for you. Question, what is the vision for you? Not for Alcoholics Anonymous, for you individually. Put your fill in the blank. What is the vision for Dave Fredrickson? What is the vision for Ted? What is the vision for Kelly? Everybody should have a vision. And if you don't have a vision, there's an extra meditation for you. All right? Get a vision. By the time you get to page 164, you should have figured out that there's a vision for you. A customized, individual, personal vision for you as a sober alcoholic out to advance God's kingdom. If you don't have that, you've missed a huge chunk of this program. Gigantic. Because right? otherwise, what are you sober for? You? One of the biggest lies in Alcoholics Anonymous. It is not a selfish program. It is a selfless program, and I can show you reference after reference after reference about it in this book. You got sober for a reason. There's probably 30 people that died that you came through the door with, and you're still sober. Why you and not them? There's a purpose for you. It should be your vision. And I'm, I'll get off the soapbox. Um, so, it says, we've entered the world of the Spirit. Our next function is to grow in understanding and effectiveness. This is not an overnight matter. It should continue for our lifetime. But I thought we went through the steps once. Right? Step 1 to step 12. I've heard that in AA, haven't you? Not what my book just said to me. This is something I'm going to be doing for the rest of my life. All right? This is not over. Can she continue for a lifetime? Continue to watch for selfishness, dishonesty, resentment, and fear. When these crop up, we ask God at once to remove them. We discuss them with someone immediately to make amends quickly if we have harmed anyone. Then we resolutely turn our thoughts to someone we can help. Love and tolerance of others is our code. Put a square around the word love. And off of that square, draw a little line and write 83 colon 1. Everybody got that in their book? Well, since we just did that exercise, let's go to 83 colon 1. 
All right? It's that bottom of that first full paragraph on page 83. Starting there where it says, so we clean house with the family. Who in here does not have any family? Nope, nobody. So every, this paragraph applies to every single person in the room. Imagine that. All right? So as part of my recovery program, if I'm going to follow Alcoholics Anonymous, I have to clean house with my family. And look at this word, asking. Put a square around the word asking. Anytime the book Alcoholics Anonymous says we ask, that means a prayer. Here comes P number one. So in your paragraph next, on the margin next to it, write P1. Top of page 83. About uh, nine, eight sentences down. It says, so we clean the house with the families. Everybody found it? All right. Asking. Put a square around the word asking. And in the margin, put P1. You might as well put M1 right next to it. All right? So it's because what are we asking? We're asking each morning in what? Meditation. What are we supposed to be doing? Prayer and meditation. How many people in here pray? Right? How many people in here meditate? It was about a third of the group that didn't raise their hand when they said meditate. If you're having problems in recovery, I guarantee you it's probably not your prayer life. It's your meditation life. Because we're great at asking for things because we're selfish and self-centered. That's easy for us. Especially when we plugged into a source of power that actually makes shit happen. You know? It's like, hey, God, you know, would you help me out with this? And boom, it happens. Man, we're going to go back to that well. That's the reptilian brain in us. You know? Cause, effect. And it's a pleasurable effect. That's why we kept going back to the bottle. Cause, effect. Whoa, that's good. Reptilian brain says go back and do more of that. That stuff's great. Right? Same thing in recovery. So prayer is not your problem. Meditation is. And here's why meditation usually is the problem. Because most of us, the first time we try to meditate, we feel goofy and we feel stupid and we feel uncomfortable. Especially when somebody's showing us how to do it. And now somebody else is watching us and the, the fear of looking bad and all that stuff comes to... We're already behind the power curve. Does that make sense? The key is meditation. All right? So what are we meditating about in this paragraph? That our Creator, a power greater than ourselves... Show us the way of patience, tolerance, kindliness, and love. The reason I had to put the word love and put a square on the last word is to remind me to go back and do this nine-step prayer here. All right? So, what am I asking God? God, please show me the way of patience, tolerance, kindliness, and love towards each member of my family. So for me, I say, okay, God, today, how can I be kind towards Brenda? Brenda's my wife. How can I be kind towards Duke, my son, or Noah, my other son? What can I do? I do the same thing for loving. And I pick out one thing that I'm going to attempt to do today to be more kind, patient, tolerant, or loving towards them. If I've been having a problem on Monday and having a problem on Tuesday of being short with my kids, let's say they use that as an example. You know, they're tugging on the shoulder, dad, 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 dad. You know, give me a minute. You know, that quick, short temper, that, let's say I'm going to, that's going to be my goal. If I had it on Monday and I have it on Tuesday and I had it on Wednesday, there's no chance in hell I'm not going to do it again on Thursday if I haven't asked God to help me not do it. That's the prayer part. The meditation part is getting a vision of what does it look like, what did the beast look like before I said that. The beast said to me, I want to be doing this. This is more important than my kid. That's why I reacted that. Give me a minute to finish what I want to do. So I get the vision in my head of what does it look like to be a better dad. To be the better dad is, no, nothing is more important in your life than God and your kid. Whatever it is, put it down. You can go back to it in five minutes. And I, I meditate on that. It only takes a second or two. And I get the vision. Now, at two o'clock in the afternoon, when they're yanking on my sleeve going, Dad, 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 I immediately go back to this morning when I had that meditation. It pops in my head, and now I'm at the turning point. Remember that from the we read it at How It Works all the time? We stood at the turning point. You get those throughout your entire day. Those are the gates I'm talking about. I'm standing at the turning point. Is this more important or is my kid? And hopefully, if I did the prayer and meditation right, I will go, oh, there's the beast. You're going over here. Thank you, Lord. And I tend to my child. The key then is then to go back and thank God because the system worked the way it was supposed to. I didn't act out yet again. And what have I done? I've cleaned up my past as I go along. Does that make sense? It's real simple stuff. Now let's go back to 79, colon 2.
We're going backwards because this is in the heart of the ninth step, all right? Says, Although these reparations take innumerable forms, there are some general principles we find guiding, reminding ourselves that we have decided to go to any length to find a spiritual experience. Comma, stop. Ask yourself the question, have I decided to go to any length? That includes when your nagging wife says for the 50 umpteenth time to go, would you please go put the garbage out? That's any length. Or when your husband has come to you and said, honey, would you please stop using the credit card to buy shoes? You've got enough friggin' shoes, and I'm going broke. We can't afford it. That you pay attention, right? We ask, look at the next sentence. We ask that we be given strength and direction to do the right thing, no matter, what does it say? No matter what the personal consequences may be. This takes me back to one of the very first things that my sponsor ever told me. Besides, be where your feet are. He made me write someplace where I'd see it at the crack of dawn when I first woke up in the morning. And so what did I do? I stole my sister's lipstick and I wrote it on the bathroom mirror. I had to steal because I'm a good alcoholic. What I want does not matter. Right? If you were to go out and look at my car, right next to the speedometer, there's a sticker and it says... What I want doesn't matter. Right next to the speedometer. Because when I'm in traffic and I'm not getting my way, I want to be going faster and wish all those idiots from Long Island would get out of my way. I can look down and right next to the speedometer, there it is. What I want doesn't matter. That's where it comes from. It's right out of the big book of Alcoholics Anonymous. I'm willing to sacrifice whatever it takes for a spiritual life. And that's really where the rubber meets the road. If you've got dissension in your recovery program, if you're not happy with the way your life is going right now, I guarantee you that's where you failed. You've got a want, not a need. Who in here has not had a meal today? Nobody. Who in here is homeless? Nobody. So who in here doesn't have any clothes on? we got food, clothes, and shelter. Every one of us. All of our needs have been met. Anything else is a want. So if you're feeling dissatisfied, I guarantee you it's a want that's not being satisfied. It is not a need. I guarantee you when you do the poor me and tell your sponsor is I'm just not getting what I need or your spouse. You know, honey, I just need you to be understanding right now. No, you don't. That's a want. I would really like it, honey, if you'd be understanding right now. And that gives them the opportunity to say no. And you'll be okay. That means you're going to have to go to an Al-Anon meeting and then go talk to your sponsor or do whatever, you know. <laughs> Does that make sense? All right. Beat that dead dog to death. All right. So let's go back over to page 84. We're making some progress. All right. So. I'm sorry? No, 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 no. That, that prayer is attached to the ninth step. It's only requirement. I went back to it to show you that it's, a, it's part of the ninth step that we made this decision. We'd go to any length to get sober. It's not a requirement for everyday prayers. I know people that go back to that paragraph and read it every single day. It's a great habit. I, that's why I say I, I like the number 12. So I say there's 12 prayers and 12 meditations. I've had people argue and say, no, there's 14 prayers and 14 meditations. I've had people come to me and say there's 60 prayers and 60 meditations. Knock yourself out. Anything above 12, and I'm happy. All right? Not that I'm controlling. but uh, <laughs> All right? So back to 84, uh, colon 2, in the middle, middle of that uh, paragraph we were watching. It says, Continue to watch for selfishness, dishonesty, resentment, fear. The watch part is meditation number two. All right? Does that make sense? What are we meditating on? We're watching for selfishness, dishonesty, resentment, and fear. Does that make sense? So what does that look like? Okay. Yesterday, what was Dave doing? Oh, Dave, was, was, he, was he resentful? Yeah, I was resentful. Okay, so I know what the resentment looks like when I'm in the, actually in the beast. So what is it going to look like today if I'm not resentful? Well, chances are, if you're like me, a lot of the same stuff happens every day. You're put in the same situation, whether it's work or home, or you'll find some repetition to your life. So each one of those is an opportunity to watch for self. Because if it's something unusual, you know, going for a root canal and you don't go for those every day, I'll give you a, a pass on that because you're not used to that every day. But getting up and have, tripping over your kid's scooter that's in the garage that's been there every single day for the last week, you don't get a pass on that one. You are not allowed to be resentful over it. Because by now, six, you've had six days to catch it, and you should have been watching for it. So that the moment you trip over it, you should have said, oh, thank you, Lord, for that opportunity to practice these principles in all my affairs. Pick up the scooter and put it behind you. Does that make sense? 
All right, so we're, the meditation is to get a vision in your head, and I'm real big on vision. What does it look like when David being patient, tolerant, kind, and loving versus selfish, dishonest, resentment, and frightened? Does that make sense? So the ninth step prayer that we went on page 83 are the positive things we're supposed to be getting in our life with our family. This is to watch out for the negative, to watch for the beast. So I need to look in my mind. What does the beast look like? How has the beast nailed me yesterday or the day before or the day before that? Or is there any situation I'm going in today where the beast usually will raise his ugly head? Let me watch for that. All right? And now if I see the beast, now i got a prayer. We ask God what? At once to remove it. There's your prayer number two. All right? On the same paragraph, second to next sentence. All right? Continue to watch for selfishness, dishonesty, through resentment and fear. Now they're giving us an instruction, a prayer that's going to happen during the day. Who in here has gone through a day and never had a resentment? Uh, I think you need to do more spiritual work. <laughs> who's, not, who's gone through a day and never had any kind of dishonesty? No lies of omission? No lies of commission? I've never gone through a day without it. I've, fear? Driven by fear. In a thousand different forms. So I get an opportunity to work on these every single day. Right? What happens when they crop up? I immediately turn to what? The source of power. I plug into God. God, please remove that from me. But that's only the start of this exercise. The moment I recognize the beast and I embrace the beast, I turn to God and say, God, remove this from me. And then what's the next sentence here? Discuss them with someone immediately. I don't know why I lied to you. I just said a bold ass right out of my mouth. I don't understand that. I don't have to wait and call my sponsor in 20 minutes. Tell the person you just lied to. I guarantee you, if you get in the habit of doing that, your ego will stop you from lying in a nanosecond because it doesn't like to look bad. You know? So if you're resentful, you know, you're really pissing me off. I've had this resentment for a week. So get it out and then get the hell away from them before you say something stupid, right? There's a lot of ways to, to figure out for yourself how to do this technique. You don't have to have a long time period before you tell somebody about it. I've had people say, well, I had to wait for my sponsor, and I, I know he was on an airplane. He wasn't going to land for six hours. Call somebody else. Wherever you work, there's got to be somebody. There's got to be 50 people in your home group. And if you don't have 50 phone numbers, you've got a problem. Go get 50 phone numbers of people. You know, Tell the per, pull into the cash-only lane, pray and meditate to get up there and hand the money to the person and say, I just got really resentful at the person behind me, or whatever. You know, The point is to get it out. It's like a mini fifth step. There's power in letting somebody else know about it. All right? Make amends quickly if we've harmed anybody. Right then and there. There's action. Boom. How can I make the amends right now? And then what? Then we resolutely turn our thoughts to someone we can help. Wait a minute. I have to turn my thoughts. What does that sound like? Meditation. Right? So the, this exercise starts with meditation, and when it occurs, it ends with meditation. All right? I'm meditating to keep my eye out for these things, for the beast to show up in my day. When it shows up, not if, when it shows up, I go through this exercise. It leads me back to meditation to get me back into the solution. So I don't need to go to my AA meeting and dump it. I immediately, no longer in the problem, I said, God, please remove this. I've told somebody else about it. I've cleaned up any harms. And now I'm focusing my attention on how can I make this right. I'm an airline pilot by trade, right? One of the, my goals in life is to try to make the TSA people at the screening station smile. You know, you want a challenge? A told person is the same kind. A New York City cop, you know, you know a brownie that's writing parking tickets all day? Try to make one of them smile. You, there's, there's a lot of opportunities to turn your thoughts to somebody you can help. It doesn't necessarily have to be a drunk. I've had seen people say, well, I don't, I'm not sponsoring anybody, and my meeting's not till 8 o'clock, and I, I don't care. The whole world is full of suffering. There's help that can be had any place you turn. If you ask God, he'll show you within, I guarantee you, within 30 seconds, a thought will pop into your head. And if you're a good alcoholic, you'll say, well, I really don't want to do that. <laughs> he just told you what to do. Go do it. All right? Does that make sense? All right. Glenn, how are we doing on time? 20, 15 more minutes. All right, we can get through another chunk of this, and I know we'll break. All right, so love and tolerance of others is our code, all right? And then we're going on to the next paragraph, all right? And we have ceased fighting anything or anyone, even alcohol. 
Do you think Bill Wilson really meant that when he said that? We ceased fighting anything? Is it okay to have a verbal argument with anybody? No. How many people have never had a verbal argument since they've been in recovery? Not me. You know, how many people have not been disagreeable in today with somebody? And I guarantee you, more than likely, it's somebody that you're very close with, like a spouse or a child, the people that you're supposed to be patient, tolerant, kind, and loving, right? So we're given some more homework here, right? For by this time, look at this next sentence. I love this. This is one of the greatest promises in this book. By this time, sanity will have returned. If I'm on a spiritual beam and I started my morning with my eyes opening up and I'm plugging into the source and I'm looking for the beast and as I'm going through my day, I'm cleaning up my mess, guess what? I'm happy. I'm peaceful. I'm serene. What does that equate to in Alcoholics Anonymous? I'm on the pink cloud. And what do all the naysayers in Alcoholics Anonymous? Well, you're on a pink cloud. Just wait till you fall off. You don't have to. Most of my sobriety at 24 years sober is on the pink cloud, and that's where you should be. If you're not there, you can get there. The only person holding you back is you. And any day that I'm not on a pink cloud, the only person I have to blame is me. His Majesty the baby's not getting what he wants. You know, get out a paper and pencil and clean it up. All right? We will seldom be interested in liquor. If tempted, we recoil from it as if from a hot flame. Put a square around that word recoil. Flip the page. We react sanely and normally. How's that for... How many people have never been crazy out of their mind in sobriety? Screaming and ranting and raving and throwing a hissy fit tantrum. Is that sane and normal? It's not anymore. When I was six months over, it was a regular occurrence. That's one of the benchmarks I use, is that promise. And we will find that this has happened automatically. Of course it's automatic if we're doing all the spiritual work to get here. It's automatic. You know, I think Bill Wilson was subtly trying to tell us a lie there. <laughs> it's happened automatically. Yeah, if you do a first step, second step, third step, ninth step, make all your amends, and you're doing 10, 11 on every day, yeah, it's automatic. It just happens. Don't know how. We will see that our attitude, our attitude, interesting, our attitude refers back to that square I just had you put in the book on the recoil. This attitude is that if alcohol presents itself and we're on a good spiritual beam, we will recoil from it as if from a hot flame. All right? That should be your attitude when you're on a spiritual beam. Because I've had people look at me and say, well, I don't know if I'm on a spiritual beam. I don't know if I can go on that 12-step call. If you're even asking that question, you shouldn't go on it. But if you're doing this thing and you've got peace and serenity in your heart, I've been in crack houses in New York. I'm still here. Didn't get... get you know, the triggers didn't get me. Oh, my. You know, how did I do that? Only because I was on a spiritual beam. I'm safe and protected. If you're going to be a peacemaker, it means you have to go where the war is. All right? Make sense? All right. So, this attitude toward liquor has been given us without any thought or effort on our part. There it is again. He's lying to us. It just comes. That is the miracle of it. We are not fighting it, neither are we avoiding temptation. We feel as though we've been placed in a position of neutrality, safe and protected. We have not even sworn off. Instead, the problem has been removed. That's a recovered alcoholic. We get recovered, ED, from a hopeless state of mind and body. We will never get rid of the spiritual malady. But if you're sitting in this room, hopefully you do not have a physical craving because you haven't had a drink today. If you're 72 hours since your last drink, you cannot, it's impossible to have physical craving. You've got to put the alcohol in your body to get it. So that's off the table. If you're not sitting here thinking about the beads of sweat dribbling out of beer or whiskey or whatever, you don't have the mental obsession, you are, by definition, a recovered alcoholic. What we're focusing in on is the spiritual malady. That's why Alcoholics Anonymous is not about alcohol. It's about finding a power greater in ourselves which will restore us to sanity if we do all the work and keep close to it. Does that make sense? All right. It is easy to let up on the spiritual program of action and rest on our laurels. We do that almost on a daily basis. Every day in your sobriety, when you've had a bad day, I guarantee you are resting on your laurels. So the next time you're having one of those days, just I hope this thought pops into your head. I'm resting on my laurels. All right? We are headed for trouble if we do, for alcohol is a subtle foe. That's why we embrace our disease. When you see the beast, embrace him, because he's a subtle foe. If, he, if you're embracing him, at least you know where he is. You've, have you all heard that ancient Asian, uh, in, you know, saying of, you know, 
Keep your friends close, but keep your enemies closer. That's exactly what they're talking about. All right? We are not cured of alcoholism. What we really have is a daily reprieve contingent on what? Maintenance of our spiritual condition. Every day is a day when we must carry the what? Vision. Meditation number three. There it is. Put a square around it. And what, what is our vision? What are we meditating on? God's will into all of our activities. There's another vision for you. So whenever you get questioning about what should I be doing, you should go sit there and meditate. Do a quick five-minute meditation. Say, God, how can I be useful for you? What should I be doing right now? I guarantee a thought will pop in your head and go do it. All right? Look at this next sentence. How can I best serve thee? Thy will might not mine be done. What does that sound to you? Prayer. There's prayer number three. These thoughts which must go with us constantly. We can exercise our willpower along this line all we wish. It is the proper use of the will. It is the proper use of God's will, not mine. Does that make sense? All right. Much has already been said about receiving strength. Here's what I'm supposed to be getting. You know, talk about the, the, the pink cloud. I highlighted each one of these. You can do it if you, do, if you want, but this is just my technique. I'm supposed to be getting strength. I got up at four something this morning and I'm still here talking. Where does that come from? Not from me. I have strength. I have inspiration. What's coming out of me, I didn't plan anything to say here. Whatever's coming out has got to be coming from God because I'm too damn tired to think of it. Direction, God's will. I just spent a meditation on God's will. So I get strength, inspiration, and direction from God who has all knowledge and power. And look at this. It's another conditional statement. If we have carefully followed directions, I should have begun to sense the flow of God's Spirit into me. To some extent, I should have become God-conscious. I should have begun to develop this vital sixth sense. Five senses, right? Smell, sight, taste, touch, hear, and hearing. The sixth sense is the spiritual one, the presence of God in my life. I should be able to get in tune with that. And if I'm going through these exercises and I'm watching when I'm selfish and I do the exercise, when I'm dishonest and I do the exercise, I'm connected to God every day, all day. And it's prayer meditation, prayer meditation. It's not something I do for 5 or 10 or 15 or 30 minutes in the morning and then do at night when I, before I go to bed and just wreak havoc throughout the rest of my day. This program is about prayer meditation, prayer meditation all day long and getting things done. I'm not getting a single thing done that I wanted to do, but I'm getting everything that God wanted me to get done done. Does that make sense? All right. But we must go further. That means action. Step 11 suggests prayer and meditation. So does step 10. We just covered it, right? Uh, we shouldn't be shy in this matter of prayer. Better men than we are using it constantly. It works if we have the proper attitude and work at it. What is the proper attitude? Go to page 55. Fifty-five colon four, the second to the bottom paragraph. There it says we can only clear the ground a bit if our testimony helps sweep away prejudice, enables you to think honestly, encourages you to search diligently within yourself. Then, if you wish, you can join us on the broad highway. With this attitude, you cannot fail. How's that for a promise? They just got done telling us what the attitude is. We have to sweep away our prejudice of, I think, I can't do this stuff. This crazy guy up there on the stage is talking about, it's just too much work for me. I don't have time in my day for that crap. That's prejudice. Sweep that away. Think honestly. Do you think maybe you could try one of these techniques and better your sobriety? All right, I'll give that one thing a try and see if that works, and then tomorrow I'll add another one. All right? Encourages you to search diligently within yourself, watching for what? Selfishness, dishonesty, resentment, and fear every day, all day, throughout the day. Right? Then, if you wish, you can join us on the broad highway. That's the admission price to the pink cloud, is going through this process on a daily basis. Not just right whenever you sit down to write inventory after you built up this huge pile of crap that you can't survive anymore. Does that make sense? Cool. Bless you. All right. It would be easy to be... Uh, back to page 86. Second sentence on the page. It would be easy to be vague about this matter, yet we believe we can make some definite and valuable suggestions. All right. Now, here I want to separate from the regular big book of Alcoholics Anonymous. I want to go to the multi-list. Why? The way the book was originally written. 
You guys, if you have the study edition, it's in the back. It's the gray pages on page 86, but you don't even have to go there. I'll read it to you. Because you notice what the big book of today says. It says, when we retire at night, guess what? Bill Wilson lied. That's not what Bill Wilson and Dr. Bob or anybody in the Oxford group was doing. What they were doing is what they wrote in the original manuscript before they changed it. But, of course, we always hear the lie in AA that the big book's never been changed. Try reading the original multilith and see how the big book's been changed. And I'll read it to you. It goes like this. Step 11 suggests prayer and meditation. Don't be shy on this matter of prayer. Better men than we are using it constantly. It works if you have the proper attitude and work at it. It would be easy to be vague about this matter, yet we believe we can offer some definite and valuable suggestions. Sound familiar, right? When you wake up in the morning, look back over the day before. Wow. It's reversed. I had forgotten that that's what this said. When I was about 15 or 16 or maybe 17 years sober, I got to the point where I couldn't do the 12 questions a night. It just, it wasn't jiving and it just, I started to naturally just started doing it in the morning. And then I was reading the multilith one day and I went over it and I went, that's why it feels better to do it in the morning. So here's what Dave Fredrickson does. When I'm doing it at night, I'm doing it with my wife. We've got this deal, and it's really kind of a cool deal. If you're in a committed, intimate relationship, and you've got some sobriety under your belt, my wife is a black belt al <clears throat> we've made a pact. We're going to do the 12 questions to have intimacy. Intimacy has nothing to do with sex. Into me see. We've all got that wall we keep up. We don't let anybody else inside the wall. I wanted to let my wife into the wall, but we had to make a pact, and the pact is, we don't comment on what the other person shares. We just listen. I'm going to let you see the craziness in my disease. I will lower the wall enough to let you look over and see what's in there. So we do the 12 questions at night. Was I resentful? Yeah, honey, I was resentful. I was resentful at you because when you did this, it pissed me off. She's not allowed to comment. Same thing if she does it back to me. She's not, I'm not allowed to comment. Even though I'm biting my tongue and blood is dribbling out of the side of my mouth because I want to defend myself with every fiber of my being and say, well, you brought it on yourself, you nut job. No, you bite your tongue. Can I make that any clearer? You do not, if you're going to try this, you do not comment under any circumstance. But it will give you unbelievable bonding power with your spouse, your significant other. If you can let them see what's going on and truly sign the sunlight of spirit behind the wall to where you be real sick, you know, we're sick as our secrets. Let's shine the sunlight of spirit in there and let somebody else see it happen and you'll get better and better and better, and you will grow, and you'll realize that you know the truth about each other, and you don't call each other on it, and you're still best friends. And even though I know where every one of her warts is, and she knows where every one of my warts is, that's the coolest thing in the world. Not only is she my wife, she's my lover, and she's my best friend. How cool is that? The only way she got there was because I let her see what's going on inside the wall, and she didn't run away screaming mad, going, he's nuts, get away. That's neat, neat stuff. So that's a technique for you. Here's the 12 questions, all right? There's only 11 questions as it's technically written in the book, and here's why I split it into 12. Because one of the questions that I'm about to read says, were we kind and loving towards all? The alcoholic in me says, well, if I was kind, I may have been thinking, you stupid A, blankety blank blank, that I answer yes to that question, because I was kind and I didn't say it out loud, I was just thinking it. So I had to split it into two separate questions, because I'm almost always kind to everybody. Very rare that I'm unkind to somebody. Because the ego in me doesn't want to be seen as, by somebody else perceived as being unkind. But the voice in my head, oh man, is that nasty. Nasty, bad, evil. You know? So I split it into 12 questions and here they come. All right. Were, was I resentful? One. Selfish? Two. Dishonest? Three. Afraid? Four. Shorthand? You got them in your book. You can read them. <laughs> Buy the tape. You can, you can get them off the tape. We've, we've only got three minutes left. Uh, do I owe an apology? Five. Have I kept something to myself which should have been discussed with another at once? Six. And here's one. Now, number six, I guarantee you, you do this with your significant other. You'll tell them a half-truth, you know, because I did it tonight. Honey, what are you doing tonight? Well, I'm driving up the turnpike. Is that a true statement? Yes, not the whole truth. Well, what are you going to do tonight? Well, I'm hooking up with Ted. We're going to go to a meeting. True statement, right? I didn't bother to tell her I was doing this workshop tonight. So I'm going to have to go home because I just realized it. I should have told her the whole deal. Ted and I are going driving to Oyster Bay, Long Island to do a workshop that I had known about for a week. But I forgot to mention to you, honey, sort of. Not really. Because she'll go, what are you, nuts? You're doing military and you, you're going to drive 
300 miles to come to a workshop and you're going to be tired in the morning? I didn't want to hear that. That's the alcoholic in me. But now in front of you and God and everybody, guess what Dave gets to do tonight before he says goodnight to his love? He gets to share something that he should have shared immediately. All right, there's number, that was number six. Um, were we kind? Number seven, and loving towards all. Eight, what could we have done better? Nine, were we thinking of ourselves most of the time? Ten, were we thinking of what we could do for others? Eleven, were we thinking of what we could pack into the stream of life? Twelve, a lot of people get hung up on this one. If you're trying to think, if you think in the morning, how am I going to get everything done that I need to get done today? Ding, 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 ding. You're trying to cram too much into the stream of life because your thought life should be, God, what do you got for me today? And you start into the process, and whatever gets done, gets done. You leave the rest up to God. Does that make sense? That's cramming too much into the stream of life. You notice it doesn't say a stream of life. It says the stream of life. There's one stream of life. It's God as he expressed himself in your life. That means you have to be meditating on what God's will for you is. That's going to become part of your vision from page one, from the last chapter of this book, of the meat and potatoes. All right? Um... But we must be careful. Here's a condition, right? That we not drift into worry, remorse, or morbid reflection, for that would diminish our usefulness to others. All right? After making our review, we ask God's forgiveness. Prayer number four. All right? And inquire what corrective measures should be taken. That's meditation number five. All right? So for my answers on those 12 questions, I'm going to go back and review those and, and apologize to God because anything of those 12 questions that I failed blocked me off from my effectiveness for Him. Meditation number four is... Um, uh, we have careful follow directions. We've begun to sense the flow of the Spirit into us. To some extent, we become God consciousness. Meditate on that one. How can I be conscious of God? Did I skip that one? I'm sorry if I did. Excuse me. It's back on the previous page at 85 colon 2. How am I supposed to know if these promises of the power of the peace, you know, and the sense of direction and, and the power of God is flowing into my life if I don't meditate on it? If I don't get the sense from yesterday to today that God really was with me yesterday. And that's how you learn it more and more. And you get used to hearing the voice of God. Because God does not put up billboards. I'm sorry. God leads by breadcrumbs. If you're going through your day, you will miss the breadcrumbs. You'll go, right, let's right past them. It's the still, small voice. Why? Because God gave us free will. That's why our will needs to be his will. So we need to be going and say, God, what do you got for me today? If you do that, the entire stream of life is perfect. It can't be anything but perfect because it's his will. Does that make sense? Cool. This is a great place to stop. When we come back, we're going to go into the questions in detail. I'll give you some ideas. We'll have some fun. And then uh, we'll, we'll cover the last page and a half that we got to go. So... We're going to do the, what is it? You know, uh, before we got started, I, I was supposed to issue you guys a warning. Are we on? Normally, before we get started, I issue a warning to everybody, and I'm sorry, but I forgot, but it's too late now, bullets out of the barrel. One of the things that we do when we do something like this is uh, this group, becomes a spiritual body, and I don't know if you felt it, but the, the group kind of gelled uh, while we were on break, and behind the wall, we all have what I like to call Pandora's box, and when we start talking about this stuff, I'm going behind your wall without really you guys realizing it, and I'm stirring the pot. I'm opening Pandora's box. One of my favorite expressions is, God's grace lasts only as long as ignorance. You walked in here fat, dumb, and happy, you know, I'm uh, just going to go hear this guy from Texas talk. Now you know the truth. You will become absolutely miserable if you don't do some of the things that you've heard here. So if you hear it, you go, oh, no, I can't do that. Guess what? <laughs> I've ruined your, your, your sobriety for you. But you're going to have to start doing this, some of the stuff. And that's the big deal with this stuff. You know, God protects us and keeps us safe as long as we're ignorant. But once you know the truth, now you can't play ostrich. You can't bury your head in the sand. That's the reason Alcoholics Anonymous ruins your drinking. Because once you've been to AA, you know the truth. You know the real deal. And you can't go out and successfully drink anymore. It just That's the ultimate test of, of that expression. Well, it also is true in sobriety, in recovery. Once you know something that you're not doing and why you weren't doing it, and you've seen the truth of it, 
you know, you will get become absolutely miserable. You will have a spiritual hangover, and your days will get worse and worse and worse. It's much easier. This is the easier, softer way, what I'm describing for you. So, sorry I didn't give you the warning up front, but, you know, Bill Wilson does that to us, too, you know. You know, before when he talks about the third step prayer, he says, you know, but before you begin. <laughs> so, that's my version of it. Sorry about that. Um, where were we? Oh, the 12 questions. All right. We did the 12 questions. Uh oh. Oh, thank you. When you go through the 12 questions, what are you supposed to do? If you're resentful, we've got an instruction for resentment, right? We write out a four column inventory. Sounds crazy, but if you want to get rid of the resentment and not relive it again tomorrow or the next time you find yourself in that situation, you've got to figure out what the fear was that was triggering it. And the only way I know to do that is to go through the process that the big book gives us. Write out the resentment. If you were selfish, can we not be selfish? Yeah, we cannot be selfish. Can we not be selfish without God? Uh-uh. The reasons you were selfish throughout your day, if you ran into selfishness, those were the times when you were disconnected from God. It goes back to meditation. Was it meditation four? Where I talked about we need to meditate on, on the presence of God in your life, that sixth sense. That's the reason. When you're in the sixth sense, the more you meditate on it, you more realize, yeah, yesterday I had it at 10 o'clock, and when I went through that situation, I really felt... That's cool. You'll get to notice God. You'll get to notice the breadcrumbs. And the more you get to notice the breadcrumbs, the more you'll focus on that as you go through in the future. Right? So it's important. So if you were selfish, those were times where you were outside of the final sixth sense. You were in the you. You were in the beast. That was the beast talking to you that caused you to be selfish. The voice, I guarantee you, there was a voice that kicked off in your head that you disregarded. That said, yeah, I really shouldn't take the last soda, but, you know, it's my turn. But whatever. Whatever that little voice was when you went ahead and did it. All right. Uh, dishonest. Like we already discussed what happens when you're dishonest. You go back to the person you tell them, I lied to you. I was dishonest to you. I guarantee you, your ego will stop that behavior. Self-correcting. Frightened. We have, an ex we have a, a spiritual exercise for that too, don't we? Page 68. Right? Ask God to remove the fear and direct our attention to what we, he would have us be. Everybody forgets the second half of that sentence. So if you're having problems with fears... Do the whole exercise. It's not enough to ask God to remove it. It's prayer and meditation. Asking God to remove it is only the prayer part. Where you're failing is on the meditation. What does God want you to be when you're feeling afraid? Trusting, faithful, reliant, courageous, whatever. You've got to answer that for yourself. And then you focus your energy at being that stuff after you've asked the prayer. And I guarantee you, the fear will leave you. You'll outgrow the need for that fear, as the promise it says in the book. Does that make sense? All right. Um, do, we, do we owe an apology? If you owe an apology, part of your plan for the day is to go make that apology. Uh, we already discussed about not sharing something with the other person at once. Share it with them as soon as you can get to them. If it's that night, call them up. If it's the next morning, it's the first thing on your list. I, gotta, I should have shared this with you, and I didn't. I'm sorry, I forgot. Uh, kind towards all. If you're unkind, I guarantee you, go back and do a fear inventory. There's fears that are triggering that character defect. You're not inherently unkind. People that are unkind are selfish and be driven by fear. Go find the fear and you'll become a more kinder person. If you're unloving, that's also driven by fear. Fear of being out of control, fear of not getting what you want. Even if it's only the voice going on between your ears. Does that make sense? Um, what, should, what could we have done better? Notice it doesn't say what should we have done better. What could we have done better? There was gates that you went through your day when you recognized the beast and you were standing at the turning point and you turned the wrong direction. That you could have done better. That was selfish. You turned towards the fear, whatever it was. That was something you could have done better. What should you have done better? Who knows? That's judging yourself. And that's where it comes with a warning of be careful not to drift into worry, remorse, or morbid reflection. Don't shit all over yourself. But there's times in your day when you could have done better and you chose not to. Those need to be corrected and identified because that's the beast bushwhacking you on the spot. Does that make sense? That's a real jewel in the mud. Pick it up, dust it off, and it goes back to becoming a jewel for you. Um, are we thinking of ourselves most of the time? That will e abate itself over time. The less selfish you are, the, the less you'll think of yourself all the time. 
the more you meditate on God's will for your life, and the more you, the less fear you have in your life, the more you will become thinking about others and God's will, and the less you'll be thinking about yourself. It just that's just the way it goes. Um, what you could have done for others, and what you could pack in the stream of life. Once again, all those attain by working on God's will, not your will. And the only way to do that is over time. But I, at least that's my experience with it. You just pro- progress on, the, you know, it's spiritual progress, not spiritual perfection. Spiritual progress. Keep working at it, and you will get spiritual progress. Which is, by the way, one of the my, my favorite pet peeves in AA. Because you'll hear that. People will say, well, it's progress, not perfection. And what did they just say? I want you to co-sign my crap because I'm not doing it, and I know I should be doing it. That's back to the previous one where, what could we have done better? Anytime you hear that, you're hearing somebody, what could you have done better? And they want you, somebody else to co-sign their crap. But that's for every sponsor in the room. Um, okay, so let's keep on going. Um, on awakening, let us think about the 24 hours ahead. So part of my process is to go back and review my day, but I need to think about the 24 hours ahead, right? How do you fit that in? I do it as part of my morning ritual. When I wake up, I thank God for the day, ask him to direct my thinking, and I usually start going into, okay, what do we got on the docket for today, God? Give me some ideas. And whatever pops in my head, I trust it. Because sometimes something will pop into my head I wasn't even thinking about. I don't want to miss that jewel. That's a nudge from God saying, hey, do you remember this? You said you were going to do it six months ago. Back on the table. You know, he's reminding me. I can disregard it, but I don't want to miss that jewel in the mud. So if you get one of those thoughts that fleetingly crosses your mind, seize the opportunity to grab that sucker. Consider your plans for the day. What are my plans for the day? Here comes meditation number six, right? Meditation number six is considering my plans for the day. What does it look like to be in God's will, right? This whole theme is meditating on God's will. My plan for the day should be, in, should be to be in the stream of life, which is God's will for me. That's why I get up in the morning, I plug into the source of power first, and then I say, okay, God, what do you got? I'm working for you today. All right? Before we begin, here comes a prayer. Prayer number five. We ask God to direct our thinking especially asking that it be divorced from self-pity, dishonest, or self-seeking motives. Right? Under these conditions, we can employ our mental faculties with assurance, for after all, God gives us brains to use. Our thought life will be placed on a much higher plane when our thinking is cleared of wrong motives. That thinking is meditation number seven. And what are we supposed to be meditating on? that God will divorce us from self-pity, dishonest, or self-seeking motives. What does it look like for Dave not to have that in his life? And I focus on that for a minute or two. Where did it look like yesterday? How can I avoid it today? It's one of the tougher meditations that you're going to get as identifying it. It's what I call advanced sobriety. Don't beat yourself up if you can't get your hands on this one. Give it time. It'll come to you the more you practice. There's a whole, remember, we did a whole lot of other prayers and meditations before we got to this point. Now we're thinking about what God's will is for us. You be, damn well better have done the other prayers and meditations to get to this point, or you will start meditating on your will for you and calling it God's will. Does that make sense? All right? <clears throat> um, in thinking about our day, we may face indecision. We may not be able to determine which course to take. So this is not in your morning meditation. This is somewhere during the day, right? We're in a different spot during the day. Here, when this happens, where we, we come to that turning point, what do we do? We make a decision and go to it, right? We ask God for inspiration and intuitive thought or decision. Look at this. We relax and take it easy. We don't struggle. You pause. You stop what you're doing. What we did before we started this thing tonight was we paused. Because I didn't know how to start this thing. That was a moment of indecision for me. How do you kick off something like this? I don't know. But I know if I go to the source of power, so you get quiet, you say a prayer, and then I had you guys sit down, say a prayer, meditate, boom, and off we were running. That's what I was doing. You got to see it in action tonight, even though you may not have understood what was going on there, but that's what I was attempting to do, and for me it worked. I don't know if it worked for you guys, but it's all about me. It's all I think about, right? Uh, <clears throat> okay, so... Um, we may not be able to determine what course to take. Here we ask God. Put another square around that. Ask God. There's prayer number six. Right? 
We're asking God for inspiration, intuitive thought, or decision. Now, some people will say that that's a meditation. No, it's a prayer. The meditation comes after it, when your mind is cleared of the wrong motives. And then it says, what used to become a hunch or occasional inspiration gradually becomes a working part of the mind. All right? So, it's, to, to me, it's debatable. Really, what I'm saying is I'm going through my day, and I'm, I don't know where to go. My problem is I'm not sure what next, the next step is for Dave to do. I get quiet and ask God to clear my mind. I'm not focusing on anything. If I come up with an answer and I try to work a math problem, my math problem will lead me to the answer. That's not what I'm supposed to be doing here. I have no idea what the answer is, and I don't want to even think I know what the answer is. That's why this, is to me, is not a meditation. It's to me to go to God and say, God, show me. Blank slate and whatever pops into my mind, that's what I do. I'm not directing my mind and trying to think about how I should do X, Y, or Z. Does that make sense? So that's why it's not a meditation for me. Being still inexperienced, we had just uh, made a conscious contact with God. It is not probably we're going to be inspired at all times. We might pay for this presumption. What presumption? The presumption of being inspired at all times in all sorts of absurd actions and ideas. Nevertheless, we find that our thinking, as time passes, will be more and more on the plane of inspiration. They come to rely upon it. All right? You're going to get better and better and better at this when you learn what is the truth and what is not the truth for you. That's why it's important to meditate on this vital sixth sense. The more you meditate on that and recognize when God was with you and when you were recognizing God working in your life, the better off you'll get at it. If you try to go through and you can't figure out why it just doesn't click, it just didn't feel right, some part of it was your will, not God's will. It just felt right and it flowed and man, you, I guarantee you will recognize the sixth sense. And everybody that's nodding their head has had that experience. They understand what I'm talking about. You will once you've had it. Until you've had it, I can't explain it to you. It's an experience. All right? Uh, <clears throat> we usually conclude the period of meditation with a prayer. Okay, so here comes prayer number seven. That we be shown throughout the day what our next step is to be. All right, so now we're back. We're not in the middle of, of our day anymore. We're, he's jumped, Bill Wilson has shifted on us. We're back in the morning. After when we do the 12 questions in the morning, review the day beforehand. Now we're back to that meditation. We're going to conclude that period of meditation with, God, please show me what I'm supposed to do throughout this day and what my next step is to be and give me whatever I need to take care of any problems I may face today. So once again, you're still seeking will for you to fly out in your day. You're looking for the beast because the beast will pull you up in God's will. If you can identify the beast and step around the beast, I guarantee you God's will will happen. That's the best way I can explain it. All right, so there's the prayer, and it says, what, what do we ask for? Especially freedom from self-will, and we're careful to make no requests for ourselves. All right? But we may ask for ourselves, however, if others will be helped. There's a meditation in there. So I need to be meditating. I ask God to give me direction, but if there's anything that I'm questioning about, well, maybe you should do this, but is that selfish or not selfish, then I meditate on it to see, is there selfishness here, God? Open my mind to it. Show me the truth of that situation. I call it the wall, fly on the wall syndrome. You kind of imagine if you were a fly on the wall looking at the situation, or like you would, let's say you were explaining it to your sponsor. A lot of times I'll go into that mindset. Well, if I was explaining this to Kirby, what would his reaction be? And I get to see it as it would play out. And if it's dishonesty on my part, from the third perspective of the fly on the wall. Does that make sense? Try it. You'll like it. <laughs> all right. So there's really two prayers there. There's the prayer that you ask throughout the day, which your next step is to be. Then I have the meditation that's in between. And then I have the next prayer, which is we ask especially for freedoms from self-will. Careful, make no requests for ourselves. To me, those are two separate prayers. I'm praying in generalities, and then when anything that's even questionable, I do the generalities. Help me handle anything that might, you might throw in my path today, God. Give me the strength to get past it. Now, is there anything that I'm thinking about doing today that might be selfish? But I might be able to do it if somebody else says, should I, what is it, what is the truth? Is that, can you see the difference between the two? Okay. <clears throat> uh, we're careful never to pray for our own selfish ends. Many of us have wasted a lot of time doing that, and it just doesn't work. We can easily see why. If circumstances warrant, we ask our wives, our friends to join us in morning meditation. If we belong to a religious denomination which requires a definite morning devotion, we attend to that also. If not members of religious bodies, we sometimes select and memorize a few set prayers. 
this is the point where I go through and I do third step prayer, seven step prayer, prayer of St. Francis sometimes. I'll add in whatever memorized prayers that I want to do. And that's how I, I mix it up as I go through, you know, in my own personal life. You know, if you're in a religious or denomination, they're telling you there should be some prayers that you should be saying there. If you're not, go find some prayers and memorize them to become part of your ritual for yourself. So that there's something that you'll always fall back on for the days when you're forgetting to do this. If nothing else, you'll be in the habit of, oh, and or you'll come. I find sometimes I'll just be driving down the road and all of a sudden I'll, I realize I'm saying the third step prayer in my head and, only, and I'm not even conscious of it. It's just going off in there and I'm hearing it or the seven step prayer. And then I've added a sentence to the seven step prayer and I'll go, oh, no, I added a sentence. There's something wrong with that. That's not the prayer. What is it? And, I, you know, I've even sometimes pulled off a little truth, pulled off on the side of the road and whipped out a little miniature big book that I always carry. And I'll, damn it. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Because it'll just, it'll aggravate the hell out of me, you know, that I've said the prayer wrong. And you start to mix and match the prayers. You know, the key thing is there, not that you got the prayer wrong, nor not that you're going senile or getting old and seeing your moment. It's that you were praying without even realizing you were praying. That's the cool the gift of that part of it. <clears throat> um, uh, so we selected and memorized a few set prayers which emphasize the principles we've been discussing. There are many helpful books also... Suggestions about these may be obtained from one's priest, minister, or rabbi. Be quick to see where religious people are right and make use of what they have to offer. As we go through the day, now he's jumping ahead again. New paragraph. Now we're back in the middle of our day. We pause when agitated, doubtful, and ask for the right thought or, or action and constantly remind ourselves that we are no longer running the show. All right? So what do we do? First of all, you have to be conscious of the fact that you're agitated. You're feeling the beast. When you feel the beast... Slam on the brakes and stop what you're doing. And then what? Go to God. God, thank you for helping me to see this. Please remove it from me. And then meditate. Get a thought in your head. What should I be doing now? What's the next right thing? We always hear that in the program, but nobody ever explains to you how to do it. Do the next right thing. I guarantee you, you can't think of what the next right thing is until you say the prayer. God, please remove whatever this is and help me to be whatever. And the next right thing will pop into your head. I've never got the next right thing before I've said the prayer to remove what was blocking me from God because I'm blocked from God. You know, in this case, we know what came first, the chicken or the egg. You know, the disease came, so I'm blocked from God. I can't get the power until I ask God to remove what's blocking me. Then I get the power and the vision for the next right thing. All right. And uh, so when I'm asking for the right thought or action, that's prayer number 10. And the meditation is meditation number 10. Does that make sense? Nine is, uh, oh, the, the, for me, the nine is a part of my meditation on God, I offer myself to thee. I think about who's God? Who is my God? God, I offer myself to thee to build my, build with me and do with me as thou wilt. So third step prayer. When I'm doing this, my set prayers, I don't just say them rote. I meditate on them. What am I actually saying? Because for a while there in my meditations, it was like, God, I offer myself to thee to build with me and do with me as I will, you know, take away the difficulties. You know, it, it became meaningless, totally meaningless. So today, I break the prayers apart. Even though they're memorized prayers, I think about it. God, who's God? What God? Is he all powerful? Is he everything or is he nothing? And how does that apply to me? I offer myself every single piece of me, good and bad, the whole nine yards. And I think about that for a second. You see what I'm saying? There's a meditation part of, of those rote prayers for me. That's nine. All right. Flip the page. So it says, we're no longer running the show. Humbly saying to ourselves, well, if we're saying it to ourselves, really what we're saying it is to God. It's another prayer. Thy will be done. There's the prayer. That's prayer number 11. We are much da less danger of excitement, fear, anger, worry, self-pity, or foolish decisions. We become much more efficient. We do not tire so easily, for we are not burning up energy foolishly as we did when we were trying to arrange life to suit ourselves. Why? Because we're living in the stream of life. We're living His will. That doesn't take any energy, because it's going to happen no matter what. If God says you're going to Nineveh, you're going to Nineveh. You can get on a boat and go the other direction, but you're going to end up, the whale's going to spit you up in Nineveh. You know, but be very careful what you ask for. You know, 
a couple of years back, I said to God one day, God, I know I can sense it. There's a change coming. Do with me what you want. You know, we've outgrown our house. And my wife and I had this conversation, and, you know, at the night we were doing our 12 questions. She said, you know, really, I can feel this change. We should be doing something. I said, me too. And she said, well, we've really outgrown the house. Maybe God wants us to move. And I said, yeah, great. Go to Pennsylvania. Dave's well. Well, I'm not going to Pennsylvania to look for a house. I said, we well, can't afford anything around here. It's too damn expensive. Go to Pennsylvania. I'm not going to Pennsylvania. Well, then get on the Internet and find some realtors in Pennsylvania. So she's like, well, can't we move to Dallas? And I go, I'm not moving to Dallas. Dave's well. Never, ever in a million. There'd be claw marks to Dallas. The only place I'd even consider is a place called Flower Mountain because I got some buddies who live there. Big mistake, Dave. Nothing pays off with the restraint of tongue and pen. It's in that order for a reason. Can't get the words back. So now, what is Dave's plan? Take my wife to Dallas just to shut her up. So I call a friend of mine who's in the program down there and say, Jan, I'm going to come down for a weekend and waste every minute of your weekend. Is that all right with you? I'm telling you up front, I'm being honest. I'm working a good program here. Wrong. I'm going to be honest with you. So we get on the airplane. My mom watches the kids. We fly down to Dallas, and I got this whole ulterior motive. Just go look at the houses, find what's wrong with each one, go back, get on the airplane, go home. Now we can say we looked in Dallas. Makes logical sense, right? But I'm sober long enough to know when that voice is just screaming, God is just... Every time we drove around this corner, there's the same sign for this builder. So we're on our way back to the airport on Sunday night. We've been looking at houses all weekend long. And I say, Jan, stop the car. We've got to go to this builder. I can't, I can't do this. God's telling me I've got to go to this builder. So I walk in and I'm me. I am nasty to this builder. So how many houses you sold this month? None. How many last month? None. And I don't know what's wrong. Well, I knew it was wrong. American Airlines is big in Dallas, and they just had a huge downturn, and all the pilots had floated the market with their houses because they couldn't afford their houses. Everybody took like a 30 to 45% pay cut. So this builder's not selling anything new because you could get these fire sales all over the place. And I knew this in the back of my mind, so I start leveraging the guy. Well, it's all right, house. And I start really hammering the guy. And I said, well, if I was to consider it, I'd want this and this. And then I threw everything in the kitchen sink in it. And he counters me. And so I counter him back, and I threw more than 50% higher amount of money back at him for all this other extras. I mean, I couldn't think of anything else to throw into this deal. He says, I have to ask my boss. So he calls, makes a phone call. He calls me back, and he says, deal, done. I said, well, I don't have any money to give you. He said, you got to give me something. I said, well, honey, we got 2500 bucks in the account someplace. She says, yeah. I said, Write him a check for 2500 bucks. I said, but I want the contract to say that I can get out at the last minute of the day. I want a weasel clause, and I told him to his face, I want a weasel clause, and I can weasel out of this deal any time I want. So I get back on the airplane, and I'm flying back to New Jersey, and I'm thinking, you idiot, you just bought a house in Dallas, Texas. What are you thinking? <laughs> God, show me your will, right? Three days later, I get a call from my big boss from Dallas, Texas. It says, Dave, I got a job for you running the drug and alcohol program for 12-step and drunk pilots but you got to live in Dallas, Texas. <laughs> and I started laughing. And I said, Mike, I bought a house in Dallas three days ago, and I did not know why. When God says you're going to Nineveh, you're going to Nineveh. And now I happily live in Dallas, Texas. Be careful what you ask for. <laughs> but when you're in the stream of life, it happens. What's supposed to happen, happens. And I could tell you story after story after story after story. When you're in the stream of life, it happens. Does that make sense? Long way, winded way of saying that. So, we alcoholics are undisciplined. The ignominy of it all. I can't believe he said that about us. So we let God discipline us in the simple way we have just outlined. You notice it says simple way. Really all he's saying is, get up in the morning, plug into the source and say, God, what do you have for me? And put whatever you want aside, because you don't get a vote. What I want doesn't matter. Now I understand what my sponsor was telling me way back when. All right? But this is not all. Oh, man. There's action and more action. Put a square around action and more action, and right in the margin, 164 colon 2. Now let's go to page 164 colon 2. Everybody there? Okay, it says, <clears throat> this book, right here, Alcoholics Anonymous, 
our textbook, right? If a tech, it's a good textbook, it's going to teach us how to do something. Hopefully, you've got some instructions on the nuts and bolts of what you're supposed to do on a daily basis. So this book is meant to be suggestive only. My buddy Chris always loves to say the expression, it's sort of like when you're a skydiver and you jump out of the airplane, they suggest you pull the ripcord, you know? That's the same thing for your recovery. You know, if you want to work the program of Alcoholics Anonymous, we suggest you pray and meditate. If you didn't get anything else from tonight, I hope you got that part. We realize we know only a little. God will constantly disclose more to you and to us. If that's not a powerful prayer, I don't know what is. What a promise. Ask him. Put a square around it. There's prayer number 12. Why am I on page 164? Because look what the next couple words are. Ask him in your morning meditation what you can do each day for the man who is still sick. The answers will come. Put a square around that. There's meditation number 12. If it's conditional. When will the answers come? If my own house is in order. But obviously you cannot transmit something you haven't got. Here's my experience with that. If I haven't said the rest of my prayers and meditations in the morning, I will come up with a blank slate for I don't know who to help, I don't know what to do. If I've started doing those prayers and meditations that we've been discussing all night long, an idea will pop into my head. Sometimes the person will pop into my head, but I won't know how to help them. Like, for example, it might pop into my head, I need to call Ted today, because I haven't heard from the guy for three weeks. That means he's in trouble. So it's on my docket, but I don't know why I need to call Ted. Do I call him to kick, kick him with my size 13 and shove it where it doesn't belong? Or do I need to call him with love and compassion and tolerance to find out, Ted, what's really going on with you? I'm really concerned about you. Talk to me, you know. I don't have that answer at that point. Why? Because in the 12 questions, there was some of that other crap that I needed to clean up. I'm still spiritually blocked from God. So I'll go clear that stuff up, and then I'll rethink about Ted, and the answer will pop. Give him size 13, or be kind, loving, and tolerant. Usually it's size 13. <laughs> He'll attest to that. Does that make sense? All right. Uh, but obviously you cannot transmit something you haven't got. Where do you get it? God. you got to plug it into the power source. You cannot be a conduit to share it with others, because we're trying to help somebody else, right? I can't help anybody else until I've plugged into the source of power. Otherwise, I'm spreading my disease. All right? See to, it, see to it that your relationship with God is right, and great events will come to pass for you and countless others. This is the great fact for us. What a promise. Abandon yourself to God as you understand God. That means you don't get a vote. What happens to you is not your business. Admit your faults to him, to God, that's the easy part, and to your fellows. Clear away the wreckage of your past. Give freely of what you find and join us. We shall be with you in the fellowship of the Spirit. There is the second fellowship in the program of Alcoholics Anonymous. There's the spirit of the fellowship, and then there's the fellowship of the Spirit. The spirit of the fellowship is just being in these rooms with your, your compatriots. The fellowship of the Spirit is those that are on the spiritual beam. There's a connection. You see it in each other's eyes, the twinkle. The, the lights are on and people are home. And you, there's an instant connection. And you can make that bond in here and have that bond when you leave here with the same exact people. I guarantee it can happen. I've got it with that man sitting over there. I called him up. I say, hey, it's me. What's going on? You must have the sixth sense. How did you know that you're supposed to call right now? Or I had it with my, with my buddy Gene the other day. I called Gene, and he's, well, he starts laughing. I said, Gene, what are you laughing at? He says, I knew you were going to call. I was just thinking about finding your number. And I said, well, God told me to call you. Why am I calling you? I had no idea. What, just God said, call Gene. And boom, we had the connection. You'll have that with people. <clears throat> Remember the meditation we did when we first started? Started at the top. We worked our way down to the breathing. You can do this. Try this. When you have a spiritual connection with somebody, whether it's your sponsor, somebody that you love that's sick, whatever it happens to be, do the meditation. Get down into the breathing. And then I want you to envision a light, a candle, a flicker, a flame. And I want you to watch the, fl the flame as you're breathing. Get that vision in your head and make it the, the flame get bigger and bigger and bigger. And you will feel a presence around you. It will almost feel like you get enveloped in heat. You'll feel warmer. You'll feel the love light. It's light. All right? 
Then think of the person that you want to send that love light to. And I guarantee you, you can send it to them. And they will call you up later in the day or later in the week, and they'll say, you know, I was thinking about you earlier, and it's peace and I was in the middle of, it was insanity. I meant to call you then. You know, what's going on? And I guarantee it'll coincide with when you were doing the love light meditation. You know? So you can do that for the people in your family. Wrap yourself in the love light. Wrap every one of your family members in the love light. You know? I surround myself with the white light of truth. Nothing but that which is of the truth and for my good shall approach me. For I am a child of God and he shall protect me. That's one of the prayers that I say every single day. That's a memorized prayer. Come up with your own. Does that make sense? Cool. That's the nuts and bolts of 10 and 11. Hopefully you've heard some things here and shared some experience that you've had some of this experience and you kind of go, yeah, and your head was nodding. Hopefully I scared you. I hope I made you uncomfortable that you saw some things that you're not doing. You're standing at the turning point. Ask his protection and care with complete abandon. Do not worry about where God's going to take you. Because remember what I said. God says you're going to Nineveh. You're going to Nineveh. Don't worry about the destination. It's all about the ride. Right? And enjoy it. It's, that's the way it ought to be. That's the way this whole deal is arranged. That's the way the whole thing is set up. Okay? Is everybody clear on that? Now, the last thing that I want to do, we got a few minutes. Glenn, how much time we got? Okay. Some of you guys have heard me do this in, in other workshops, and it's a technique that I normally don't like to do, but there's a presence here. Remember I said you embrace the beast. Well, how do you know when the beast is on you? The beast is on you, and you, you sometimes you can you can always sense it hindsight. Hindsight's twenty twenty. You can always see that I was under the beast, but why didn't I see it while I was going on? You know, because once the word's out of your mouth, once the bullet's out of the barrel, you can't get it back. You can want it, and just, oh, it's just not there. You just can't get it back. Why didn't I see it? You know, I kept going through my life, and I just kept realizing I could see it happening, and I couldn't stop it. I could see it building. I could feel it. You know, I saw it coming, and then there it was, and I sat down with my sponsor, and I'm going, you know, I just don't understand this. I could see it, and I was going through it, and I couldn't stop it. What's wrong with me? It was a voice in my head that I knew was the beast, but I hadn't identified the voice. So I try to get in touch with the voices. One of the techniques we use is an ad adaptation from a book by Scott P Peck called The Th uh, People of the Lie. And we do something called Theater of the Lie. When I'm triggered by a fear, when a fear gets inside of me, all my character defects are triggered by fears. Let's go to page 62. Let me show you that to you. 62 colon 2. Attrition, 62 colon 1. I'm going to start there. So it starts off, selfishness and self-centered. That, we think, is the root of our troubles. What's the deal about a root? If I take a plant and I cut the top of a plant off, what happens? I saw one the other day. A guy came along and he cut a tree. He left about three feet of the tree, of the trunk. You know, you could just see he was lazy. He just stood up there with a chainsaw. He wasn't going to bend down for anything. Cut it off. Bottom of that tree had shoots coming out of it. There was like 60, 70 shoots. It was amazing. It looked, I thought it was a shrub at first. And then I realized, wait a minute, there's a stump in the middle. That's a tree. And those are all fresh shoots. You cut the top of a plant off, it multiplies. What happens when you shake the dirt off the roots of the plant? Air gets on there. The sunlight of the spirit gets on there. It dies. The whole plant dies. Everything about the plant dies. Every limb, every flower, every piece of that plant dies. So what he's saying here, selfishness and self-centered is the root of our trouble. We can get rid of selfishness and self-centeredness. We can get rid of our alcoholism. Do we have a snowball's chance in hell of that ever happening? Not without God. I think not. Right? So, driven by a hundred forms of fear, self-delusion, self-seeking, and self-pity, we step on the toes of our fellows and they retaliate. Look at all those cells. Let me throw a, a proposition out at you. They're all the same thing. Driven by a hundred forms of fear, 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 and fear. We step on the toes of our fellows and they retaliate. Sometimes they hurt us seemingly without provocation, but we rarely find that at some time in the past we were afraid, which made us make decisions based on self that later put us in the position to be hurt. 
Does that make sense? Fears drive every one of my character defects. If I look deep enough underneath every single thing that I do that's negative, I guarantee you there's a fear there. I can't get to the fear until I recognize the defect. That's part of theater of the lie. I need to be able to identify the characters that talk to me when I'm afraid. Then I can hear the characters and I go, whoop, slam on the brakes. I recognize that character. There's the beast. Then I can go back and look for the fear. Does that make sense? It's a long way around writing quick inventory in about a nanosecond. All right? So our troubles, we think, are basically of our own making. They arise out of ourselves, and the alcoholic is an extreme, extreme example of self run riot, though he usually doesn't think so. Above everything. Does that mean this is important? Above everything, we alcoholics must be rid of this fear. We must or it kills us. God makes that possible. Not Dave. God. And there often seems no way of entirely getting rid of fear without God's aid. Many of us had moral and philosophical... Philosophical convictions galore, but we could not live up to them even though we would have liked to. Neither could we reduce our fear much by wishing or trying our own. We had to have God's help. So how does it work? I'm going through my day, and I hear one of the voices. The reason I got to know the voices is because I wrote resentment inventory, and anybody that's been resentful knows the deal. You know. So who in here has been resentful today? Somebody's got a resentment. You're right in front. What's your resentment? Who's it again? Column one is her boyfriend. What's his name? Matthew. Matthew and column one. Why are you mad? Because he's not coming tonight. Right? Right? How does that affect you? Right? We got, the, we got the areas of self, right? Seven areas of self. Your personal relations. How does it affect that? It affects your personal relations. Does it affect your sex relations? Is he your boyfriend? So it affects your sex relations. Does it affect your pocketbook? Okay. Does it affect your security? Does it affect your ambition? Yeah, yeah. What we got going here? Does it affect your pride? Yeah. We got a full Monty here, right? <laughs> this is this is the full deal, the real deal, all right? So what did, did you guys hear the exact same thing that I heard? And, and I do this so often that it's, it's like second nature. It's so easy. What I heard was, he's not coming tonight. What voice was that, right? We got the girlfriend, right? We're dealing with the boyfriends. We got the girlfriend. But who else is in there? Who's making that decision? We got the judge. Uh, uh, uh. You better come because I told you to come. Good thing. And you need this because I know better than you. You need this, right? We got the judge. Right? We also, if there's a judge, there's a jury. The jury had to be there because the jury is the one who made the determination. What's he doing tonight? Did he tell you? He's got to be doing something. He's got to be something on TV. He's in fights. Oh, so he's doing something he wanted to do rather than something you wanted to do. Right? So he's doing what he wants to do. Man, I can't believe he's that selfish. <laughs> so, so we got the judge, we got the jury, and now he's going to pay, isn't he? Yeah. <laughs> we got the executioner. Right? The executioner determines what the sentence is. Right? He's, how is he going to pay? He's going to pay somehow. You're not going to do his laundry. You're not going to make dinner for him. He's not going to get any nookie. What's, what's his penalty going to be? Can you... All three. All right. Woo! Right? There's the executioner. But the executioner doesn't carry out the execution, you know? The executioner is going to figure, lie in wait, right? So there's the hit woman. Who go, you know, you just wait till he wants a little something out of this sweet pie, huh? You get nothing. Not this week. This week. For my altar. He is not going to get it from me. Right? That's the deal. Who's talking about that? That's Rambo. R Rambo, for a man, for you, it's Zena the Warrior Princess. Because you're going to do battle. You don't care what the cost. Because the defiance of an alcoholic, even if we know, to me, the classic picture of an alcoholic is that, that cartoon of the little mouse and the eagle with the claws is about to nail the mouse and the mouse is sitting there giving him the bird. He knows he's going to die, but that little mouse is alcoholic. He doesn't care. <laughs> That's us. You don't care what it's going to cost your relationship. You are going to make him pay, and he is going to suffer, right? Now, if he's outside the wall or inside the wall, there's something really important here. If he's outside the wall, most of us keep the people in our lives outside the wall, but there's a few people like boyfriends and husbands and wives that we let inside the wall. If they do something which hurts us inside the wall, there's the traitor. That's the one where he crushes our spirit. If it's outside the wall, they just hurt our feelings. We can get over that in a day or two, talk to our sponsor. That's easy stuff. 
if they betray us, if they have an affair on us, if they do something that's at that level where they disclose one of our deep, darkest secrets that we're going to take to the grave type stuff, that's the traitor. That's the Benedict Arnold. That stuff you don't get over in a month, two months, six months. Sometimes you never get over it until you do some spiritual work. So you need to under, understand the voices. So as you were going through this thing, what's his name again? Matthew. Hey, Matthew, there's this crazy guy from Texas coming out to speak. I re- can we go together? I'm not going to that thing. What's the first voice she hears? What do you mean you're not going to that thing? Right? There's the queen. What do you mean you're not going? I'm the boss here. You're supposed to be going here. And she immediately starts to get the committee together, and they start doing this little discussion. Well, what do you mean? You know, and then over here, you got... You, you got Zena the Warrior Princess going, you better rethink that because don't get me pissed. You know, I'm going to take it out on you, right? And now he's in a position to judge it, and he really doesn't care. He doesn't give a rats. I ain't going to that stupid thing. Go have, have a good time, honey. God bless you. Go in peace, you know, to quote Mark. That's one of his favorite expressions, you know. And then the collusion starts, and then the voices start. Each one of those voices, as you start to hear it, is an opportunity to recognize that the beast is awakening you. How important is it? It's not that important in the scheme of things. Is it worth ruining your relationship over? No. And really, the important point for this whole thing is, now she slams on the brakes. Let's say by some miracle before tonight she figured it out. She slams on the brakes and goes, why is this bothering me so much? God, show me the truth. Give me the wisdom to see this. What am I afraid of? What's the fear that's underlying it? You're afraid that he's not going to get this and you're going to outgrow him. He's not going to be the partner that you want to be. You can see into his wall and you can see that he's suffering and you think that this might be an answer for him because you love him. You're afraid of being out of control. You're afraid that he really doesn't give a shit about your relationship at the level that you care about it because you would go in a heartbeat if he asked you and it's not reciprocal. And that puts the fear of God in you. But that's because you're in the driver's seat. It's not, you don't get a vote. He is who he is. You can't change him. You can change you. The only way you can lead is by example. You get to go back and go, oh, man, you missed the best thing tonight. You should have been there. You should have been there. You know? Come here, honey. Let me get some. <laughs> <laughs> then everybody wins. <laughs> right? Am I wrong? Yeah. That's the, <laughs> that's the way it's supposed to be. But not us. We're the mouse. We're sitting there giving it up. You know? Not me. He's going to pay. And I... Who's really suffering? You are. You're drinking the poison, expecting him to die. And he's home watching the Knicks or whatever, and he's happy as a pig and crap. You know? Now, let's say a miracle happens. While you're off, he decides, you know what? That was really stupid of me. And you walk through the door, and the house is meticulously spotless. He's done the things that you've asked him to do, and nagged at him, and nagged at him, and nagged at him. He's done, we'll give him the benefit of the doubt, two of the things you've been asking him to do. Are you going to recognize that? Hell no. Why? Because he should have been, you should have been where I said you should have been. Instead of walking through the door saying, wow, thank you. I really appreciate you doing that for me. And let me tell you, it was a great seminar. It was absolutely wonderful, but I bought the CD so you can listen to it. Now, come here. <laughs> it was a much better outcome, I think. But I can't have any hope of stopping that stuff until I can see it. Does that make sense? Who's that? Where's a guy? Give me a resentment from a man. What do you got? You're mad at your mother. Oh, I love that. Mom, call him one. Call him two. Why? So she's, you're mad because she screamed at you? Or you're mad because she woke you up? Are you mad because she screams or are you mad because she rubbed her nose in it? Ah, there we go. Now we got the truth. Why am I so focused in on why we, what we have in column one, column two? Because column three is based off column two and column four is based off column three when you write inventory. If there's a lie in column two, all of column three is a lie, all column four is a lie. Does that make sense? So you've got to get down to the truth. It's like saying my father beat me. When, every single day? Well, no, he hit me when I was a kid. Well, that's a lot of years. Let's narrow it down. Well, three times he beat me. Oh, okay. When my father beat me when I was a child. That's the truth. Our ego likes to hide a whole bunch of lie under one little piece of truth and then expect everybody to bite off on it. It's not going to happen. So, 
Column one is mom yelled at me. Column two is, or oh, excuse me, column one's mom. Column two is, is mom yelled at me and, and rubbed my nose in the fact that I'm not doing what I'm supposed to be doing. So, how does that affect you, your self esteem? Yeah. Your ambition? Is that the man you want to be? Your personal relations? Sex relations? <laughs> ah, but look at this twist. Do you have a girlfriend? Well, if you had a girlfriend, would you be a, a, real anxious to go over and see her and cuddle up with her and say, hey, honey, how you doing? Or would you just, like, swear women off altogether, you know? Yeah, it, it, so it has the potential to be a, affect your sex relations, even though it's with your parent, right? Your, uh, your pocketbook? Yeah, absolutely. Your pride? Yeah. So it's almost a full Monty here, all right? So where's the truth? You know, where are you being selfish in this deal? You should have gotten out of bed. You knew you were supposed to be up out of bed. You know, you're being irresponsible. <clears throat> where, where, what are you being dishonest about? That's right. You were lying through the whole thing because you knew you should have been in bed. So you're being lying. But who you're lying to? You're lying to yourself. You're lying to your mother. Who else you're lying to? God. You work for God. You know, you weren't being effective for God if you're lying in bed. You know, what were you seeking? Self-gratification. He was being lazy, right? And what were you afraid of? Having to work, having to face life. It could could be a countless set of of fears underneath there. Uh, uh, Probably there's some of the mouse in you that your mom is right, afraid of letting her see that she's right, and I really am a lazy sack of manure, and I should have been out of bed five hours ago, you know, to be honest. Yeah, four hour nap at three o'clock, great. I wish we all had time to do that, right? So we got mom, right? So what's here's the characters while he's lying in bed. Get out of bed. So the first voice, if there's a mom, there's got to be a son, right? And the son says, Mom, would you just stop yelling at me, right? So you got the son. Who else is in there? What if... No, what other voices in your head start conspiring on why your mother's wrong? If she just asked me, what's, who is that? If she would just bow at my altar. It's the victim, right? We got a son and we got a victim. If you would just be nice to me, Mom, but now I'm going to show you because you were nice to me. I'm not getting out of bed. You know, that's the voice that goes through our head, right? So we got the victim. We also have the, the defiant alcoholic in there, right? Who's he, who, where's the real conflict? It's within yourself. There's a spiritual man in there who really knows that he shouldn't be lying around for four hours in bed in the middle of the afternoon. He should be out being effective for God. You know, a 20-minute cat nap is fine, you know, power nap, but four hours is sloth by anybody's term, <laughs> right? Right? So the, these voices start to conspire, and who do they start conspiring? we got the judge, we got the jury. We got the executioner, because how are you going to get even with mom? Stay in bed, but what else? You're not just going to stay in bed. No. You're going to rub her nose back in it. Yeah, you're going to be defiant and show her, you know. You're going to get up when you damn well please. You know, that'll show her. You know, how many of us have ever gotten drunk over that? You know, you get you get in a fight with your, your significant other, you know, and I'll show that bitch. You watch this, you know. Total, total lie. <laughs> Just like, give me an excuse. You know, as my father would say, it's, it's Queen Elizabeth's unbirthday. So let's get hammered, <laughs> you know, and except for one day a year when it is her birthday. So I'll drink to the queen, you know, so we don't need an excuse. We'll make one. You know, we drank when times were good. We drank when times were bad. We drank when we were happy. We drank when we were saying we drank. That's the same kind of emotions we go through. And it's the same voices in our head that give us the justifications. We're just not drinking. But the same rationalization and thought process that allowed him to stay in bed for how long, much longer after mom yelled? Yeah. So 15 minutes plus another 10 is 25 minutes, right? That process that allowed you to justify that is the same process if it's allowed to take to the end level. It's the voice that allows us to get back on the bar stool that says that that's okay, that behavior is okay. It's the same behavior that says it's okay for you to treat him like that because I'm a loving child of God and I'm going to teach him. There's a conflict there. It doesn't work that way. 
Does that make sense? Yeah. Let me throw a couple more characters at you for you guys to think about. In the financial arena, right, there's the banker, right, but there's also the accountant. The banker is the one that is in conflict over the money because he's talking to the accountant that knows that there's not that much money and I don't know where the money's going to come from. It's the money, for those of you that live paycheck to paycheck, the banker is the one that says, yeah, you can afford that because you know you're getting 20 bucks, you know, on Friday. And so you, it's not deficit spending because you've got the money, but it just not happens to be in your pocket. That's the lie you tell yourself. The accountant is the one that talks to you when you spend the 20 bucks anyway, and now you put it on the credit card because you have no idea where the money's coming from, but you worry about that later. Can you see the difference between the two? So when you start dealing with financial things, there's the accountant and there's the banker. It can create a lot of havoc, and they deal with it. Anytime there's a spouse, there's a husband or a wife, a boyfriend or a girlfriend. Anytime there's a child, there's a parent and a child. And you can reverse roles. Sometimes as an adult, I can be dealing with my kids, and the child in me will come out because I'm hearing and parroting back what I was taught growing up in an alcoholic household. And I'll shift seamlessly between those two. And anytime you start to catch one of the voices, and you have, you're at the turning point, your ego is so good, it'll shift into another voice in a nanosecond. And, and now you'll lose it. You'll almost have it and be able to stop it, and then another voice will kick in. And it'll start to push you over to justify the behavior. The more you can do this, and work with the theater of the lie, and work with the characters in your head, and get to know those characters that talk to you on a regular basis. And for those of you who are thinking about it, any time you've driven from point A to point B, and you can't remember how you got there, I guarantee you, you were in the theater. The entire time, the hamster was on the wheel, and the voices were going like this. Anytime you lay your head on the pillow, and you can't get to sleep because the voices are on your head, meditate on it. Just think, what voices are there? I guarantee you, you'll stop it in a nanosecond. Because you'll start to see the voices. You go, oh, there's the beast. God, please remove those. What's triggering all that stuff? Oh, I'm afraid. I'm afraid of, and usually it's finances in those instances. It's finances or we've done something wrong that we knew was wrong and we just don't want to stand up and be counted and say, you know what? I know you were 99.9% .9 wrong, but I was that 0.01. I'm sorry. Boom. All right? Thank you so much for the opportunity to come out here tonight. I hope you learned something. I hope I stirred the pot on you. Um, I would encourage every one of you, I know it's late, uh, but I would encourage you to go home and do page 75, do a quiet hour afterwards. And I don't care if it's a full hour, but sit down and meditate on, on your, your foundation, complete willingness, your cornerstone, you know, which is the second step, your keystone, which is the third step, so that you can face tomorrow Tomorrow, start off like I said. Try it my way. Get up the moment your eyes open. Go to bed tonight with the last thought you think of. When my eyes open in the morning, the first thing I'm going to do is say, thank you, God, for another day, for a chance to live in a decent way. God, please direct my thinking. Keep my thought life divorced from self-pity, dishonest, and self-seeking motives, especially the self-seeking and the wrong motives for it. And start your day. Go to the 12 questions and do the 12 questions as part of your prayer and meditation. And then watch what happens with your day. You're standing on the precipice of advanced recovery, what I call advanced sobriety. You can go back to just sitting in AA meetings, dumping and bitching and complaining, or you can launch yourself to the next level. And you'll get to the next level, and you'll coast there for a little bit, and then God will put a chunk in your life that'll be hard to choke on. You'll go through the process, you'll write another inventory, and you'll get back to the basics of doing the 12 and 12, 12 prayers, 12 meditations, and you'll go to the next level. That's what my recovery has been every time I've ever faced it. Any problem you think you've got in your life is not a problem. It's a solution. It's a, it's a jewel in the mud. You know, if there was a pile of mud and dog manure down there, and I took the Hope Diamond and threw it in there, I don't think there's not a person in this room that wouldn't reach in there and pull it out and wash it off. That's what the problems in your lives are. you just got to get to the washing part. The 12 questions, the 12 prayers, the 12 meditations, is the washing process we do on a daily basis. If you're still jammed up after you've talked to your sponsor and done the spiritual work, write an inventory. Go back to step one. Work. It's time for you to write inventory. You've built up spiritual plaque, as I call it. I write inventory as a minimum twice a year. Any time I take a newcomer through, I write inventory. And anybody in this room that says they don't have time, let me give you a little snapshot of what my life entails. I fly for an airline. I fly for the military. I'm in the reserves. I'm a federal officer. 
I am the liaison for the federal officers. I teach the drug and alcohol school for the FAA. I am the aeromedical coordinator. I supervise 110 pilots that are in recovery. I volunteer at a juvenile prison. I am a father and a husband, and I have two loving children. And that's just a small piece of my life. Don't you dare think of saying that you don't have time in your life. You work for God. The only reason I'm able to do any of that stuff, the only reason I'm here right now, is that I get up every morning and say, God, what do you got for me? A couple weeks ago, I got up and said, God, what do you got for me? The phone rang, and it was Glenn and Kelly conspiring <laughs> against me to get me up here. If you ever want to get in touch with me, my email address is aadave1 at aol.com. If you didn't write that down fast enough, buy the CD, and it's on the CD. Feel free to email me. I have written countless stuff, thousands and thousands of pages on the nuts and bolts of the 12 steps. If you're a female, I will turn you back to other females. I will point you in the right direction. I no longer hear female fifth steps. Because it's not right for me to have an intimate relationship with another woman when I'm married. My most intimate relationship should be with my wife. If you're a parent and you're worried about having to figure out how to be a parent, 12 traditions, 12 concepts, the principles of this program is how we run my family. You come to my house, and I guarantee you, at my house, some point within an hour, you'll hear, I make a motion. We have a motion on the floor. What's the motion? I make a motion that after dinner we ride our bikes and then come back and go for a swim with the puppies. We have a motion on the floor. Do I have any seconds? I have a second. Boom. Well, no, that's not going to work because you didn't finish your, your uh, homework. So how about we walk the puppies and then we'll swim tomorrow when we don't have as much homework because it's not a Monday. Okay, all in favor of that. We have a minority opinion and let's take a vote. We have a secondary vote. Only the minority opinion gets to be heard, then we have a second vote. God expresses himself through the group conscience and that's what my family does. I am the chairman of the committee and they can vote me out. It is not a right because I'm the father and they know that. My wife right now is in charge of the financial committee. She'll come to me and say, honey, I want to buy plants for the back garden. I'm like, okay, I don't get a vote. It's not my business. I haven't seen a paycheck in months and months and months. And for the men in this room, they're going, you what? I don't get it. It's hers. It goes in, it's one pot of money and it all belongs to God. It's God's money. It's God's car. It's God's house. It's God's kids. It's God's sobriety. You know, you give it all to God and he gives it right back to you. Does that make sense? If you're in, in a relationship, do not go to regular A meetings to learn how to have a relationship. You will learn how to get divorced multiple times. <laughs> go to people that have been successfully married for long periods of time working the 12 steps. There are couples meetings. Glenn has got dozens of sets of recovery tapes with couples. I have a couples meeting that meets in my home. I have rules. I will send you rules. And here's how the rules go. There's 19 rules. Rule number one in my family is no matter what happens, it's Dave's fault. Now what the hell are we going to do about it? We used to spend hours of time fighting over, well, it's your fault, it's my fault. Now, it's my fault. And feel free to use that. There's people all over the world that use rule number one. I'll call my friends and they'll say, Dave, man, you were in trouble last week. Oh, that's okay. I'm, I can handle it. Make it my fault. And But the important part is now what the hell are we going to do about it? Let's get to the fixing. I can share that stuff with you. Um, there's a lot of stuff. For the men in the in the room, I have an exercise called What Women Really Want, written by women for men. You will not get to read it. I will send it to your significant other with the instructions. Add anything you want, make any changes or additions or deletions, and then give it to your significant, give it back to the man. I have yet to have a woman not say, where in the hell did you get that? That's exactly what I'm looking for. If you want to take your relationship, men, to the next level and finally get her off your back, have her get in touch with me. You've got my email. I will email it to her. She'll fix it and give it back to you. If you're up for the challenge, I throw the gauntlet. There it is. There's a lot of resources outside this book. It all starts with the basics of what's in this book, and then it goes on from there. You know, I can give you all kinds of exercises with sacraments of penance and you name it. But I, every time I write inventory, I start here, and I use that as my foundation and go on. All right? So it's been an absolute pleasure for me to be here. It's been an honor. I thank you, and I thank God for giving me the opportunity. And go in peace.
Thank you for listening. I hope you enjoyed the podcast. Sobercast is ad-free, and we'd like your help in order to keep it that way. So if you'd like to help us be self-supporting by pledging a dollar to a month, visit Sobercast.com and look for the donate links. Thank you very much.